So good morning everybody and welcome to the 27th meeting uh, this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, let me remind people in the uh, audience that uh, mobile phones should be switched off as they should with the uh, participants. However, people will be using tablets, etc. Uh, to uh, carry out the, pub the, the business of the public, uh, uh, the business of the meeting. Uh, on their papers. So agenda item one is subordinate legislation and uh, to consider the sulphur content of liquid fuels Scotland regulations 2014 SSI 2014-258. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument and I refer members to the paper. Um, are there any comments to be made? Members, if you have no, no comments to make at the moment then we will uh, agree that we shall not make any recommendations. Angus. Oh, Angus does, sorry. Yeah, yep. yeah thanks, convener. Um, it was just uh, for, for um, information that may interest the committee that uh, Ineos, the, the owners of the petrochemical and, and refinery plant in, in my Falkirk East constituency, have invested heavily in the software recovery units, uh, so the issue has been dealt with uh, at source as well. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any no further comments, are we agreed that we don't wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? Agreed? Thank you very much. We'll move on to the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland 2013 annual report. It's the second item today. Uh, we will take evidence from the uh, Minister, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, and uh, his assisted today by Hugh Dignan, Wildlife Manager, Branch Team Leader, uh, Wildlife Manager, Branch Team Leader, <laughs> uh, and Karen Hunter, Wildlife Crime Policy Officer in the Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, Minister, I guess we should straight into questions. You don't wish to say anything at the beginning. Um, I, I would if that's okay. Could well, be yes, please. I, I appreciate, have a short appreciate the opportunity. Remarks. Thank um, you. I, I hope it will be of, of value to the committee. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to be here to give an update on Scotland's second annual report into wildlife crime. We're all here clearly because the 2011 Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act introduced the requirement for the Scottish Government to lay an annual report before Parliament into the extent of wildlife crime. As you're aware, this is our second report and I'm pleased we've been able to implement some improvements based on feedback that my officials and I have received. Last year, I said this publication should serve as a reminder of the importance of doing everything we can to challenge these abhorrent crimes. The reasons for doing so remain the same because until they are eradicated, uh, the impacts of wildlife crime will continue to stain Scotland's reputation. And I know I'm not alone in holding the view that this is simply unacceptable. Whilst we cannot uh, possibly see trends and data in only two years, uh, this report has shown that poaching and coursing are again a high volume area of crime. Whilst poaching may not harm the conservation status of deer, certainly the loss of a golden eagle such as Fernan at the end of 2013 or the mass killing of red kites in Rossier in March this year uh, will certainly have consequences for those local populations of rare raptors. I share the revulsion of many people that these cruel and selfish crimes against raptors still occur in the 21st century. The 2013 report again includes uh, court proceedings for wildlife crime offences over the last five years, uh, police recorded crimes for the last five years, uh, recent legislative changes and the future direction of wildlife crime policy. We've endeavoured to simplify the look of the data in the report by recording offence type by species rather than legislation. We've also added subtotals to tables to better see the changes in numbers across a five year period. And I hope that you'll agree that these minor changes have improved the reader's experience and understanding of a complex and difficult area. Before I move on, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of the key contributors to the report. The Scottish Government Justice Analytical Services Team, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Police Scotland and the National Wildlife Crime Unit have again, once again supplied figures and explanation to this year's report. Paw Scotland stakeholders have also participated by providing advice and feedback, which I know has been valued by my officials. And last year I said I would be, uh, it would be ideal if we could track each criminal case from discovery through to detection, uh, prosecution and ultimately the court disposal. We still are at a point where the justice system data simply doesn't allow that follow through. Uh, but it is clear that, for example, data on recorded crime is almost impossible to reconcile with court statistics because of the often lengthy time periods between the crime taking place and the court hearing. 
Uh, some information is also available on a financial year basis with others on a calendar year basis. Uh, and last year I talked about these difficulties and the need for change in this respect. Indeed, as ACC Malcolm Graham said last week when he was uh, sitting very here uh, in, in uh, the uh, uh, committee room, I know that key officials from the various agencies are starting work on getting the data more consistent for next year's report. If we now look at 2013 in some detail, we saw that the first ever case went to court to consider prosecution under the vicarious liability provisions brought into force by the 2011 Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act. It remains to be seen what the outcome of this will be, but I am in no doubt that close attention will be paid to its outcome, not least by me. Uh, I am aware of a second potential case uh, which is due to commence this month. In February last year, I announced a further two years funding for the National Wildlife Crime Unit in Livingston. The uh, National Wildlife Crime Unit provide a valuable service to police nationwide by providing intelligence packages and investigative support. I also announced three new measures to assist in the fight against wildlife crime. Uh, Professor Mark Pousty from Strathclyde is midway through the review I initiated uh, of wildlife crime penalties and will report back to me probably now in the early new year. Um, and both Police Scotland, who appeared before you on the 29th of October, and the Lord Advocate have confirmed the use of all appropriate technology for investigations, including surveillance cameras. I note that ACC Malcolm Graham has, of course, outlined the restrictions that they face in this regard, but I am confident that such techno technology can be used where it is appropriate to do so, and the Lord Advocate has made clear that this is an option available to Police Scotland. Uh, perhaps the new measure that has been attracted most attention has been my announcement of the introduction of new restrictions on the use of general licence uh, by Scottish Natural Heritage, where there is evidence of wildlife crime taking place. This measure was formally announced on the 6th of October, and while this alone uh, may not eliminate such selfish and cruel practices overnight, I firmly believe that it will be a deterrent to those contemplating criminal acts, both in terms of its practical impact on those land holdings to which it is applied, but also its reputational impact too. We should also bear in mind that the general licence is a privilege, not a right. It, it reflects whether we feel we can trust its provisions to be responsibly used or not, and constitutes a very light touch form of regulation. It seems absolutely right to me uh, that we're based on evidence provided by Police Scotland, there is a strong reason to suspect wildlife crime is taking place and trust has been lost, uh, that that privilege should be withdrawn and greater scrutiny applied. Um, crucially, SNH will be able to consider this restriction in cases from the 1st of January this year, uh, so it remains to be seen when the first restriction will be imposed by SNH, the circumstances it will be deployed in and the effect it will have. I know that implementing this restriction has not been a straightforward measure, and this is reflected in the length of time taken to finalise the scheme, and I'd like to thank all of those who were involved in its implementation. I can confirm that both informal discussions with stakeholders and the Crown uh, with regard to pesticide disposal scheme, uh, which I will formally announce shortly. Uh, the scheme will focus a resource, uh, sorry, uh, uh, focus on removing uh, illegal substances that are most commonly used in wildlife crime, and it's already an offence to possess. These are listed in the Possession of Pesticides Scotland Order 2005, but can include strychnine, carbofurin, and cyanide. And finally, convener, this report is designed to inform our response to wildlife crime and ensure appropriate scrutiny of trends as they emerge. Wildlife crime is an issue I am determined to attempt to eliminate, and the report is a useful tool in monitoring progress. I look forward to answering your questions on the annual report. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister. I'm sure that members will take into account your initial remarks uh, when they come to their questions. Um, I'd just like to start off with the report that's due for 2013. Um, because there are so many different sources of information, have you got them all to agree to do them on a calendar basis? Uh, what's the situation that we can expect? Well, there, there have been discussions on, on this matter. Clearly, ACC Graham uh, mentioned this last week. Um, it is, uh, has been since the previous report uh, a, a cause of frustration that there, there is difficulty in reading across um, from different tables and, and tying up uh, trends in that way in, in future years. So I think there has been a, a, obviously some difficulty in, in uh, determining a, a solution, uh, but I do believe there's a willingness to, to take forward that, uh, that approach to try and get standardisation of reporting on, on a consistent basis. Um, but I just uh, wonder if um, Hugh Dignan could maybe comment further on the discussions that have taken place where uh, I've not been present in those discussions, Convener. Certainly. Uh, Yes, well, uh, as the Minister says, it certainly is our ambition to do that, and we've been working towards it. Um, it's not 
uh, as easy as one might hope in as far as that these data systems sort of stretch right back as far as the uh, officer on the ground or the court official inputting data at the very beginning of a data collection system right through to the way that data is collected and stored and analyzed and then repro reproduced by the uh, statisticians at the end of the process. So I, d I don't think it's something we can change overnight. Uh, I hope we can certainly make progress for that with the next report. I'm not guaranteeing that we can find uh, everything in, in, in a standard format by next year, but it's certainly something we're working towards. Are there any particular ones of your uh, sources who are finding it more difficult to bring this into a calendar year uh, format than others? Uh, I'm not aware that there's any particular organization that's finding it more difficult. I think that what is happening is, is that uh, people are now recognizing that this is uh, something which is a regular piece of work. It's a sub substantial and important piece of work, and we think that they're giving it uh, the attention and uh, you know, putting, providing the input that we think it deserves. So we're making progress on, you know, across the board, I think. Thank you. Add one comment, convener. Uh, there's also the complication, not just the calendar year, and uh, uh, please stop me if it's something that you're going to ask about yourself, but uh, there's the complexity of, of the nature of the, the charge that's laid, and in some cases the wildlife offence is actually a minor, relatively minor or secondary offence to the main uh, offence that's being taken forward by the Crown Office. So therefore unpicking that and, and, and identifying cases where perhaps uh, wildlife crime is not the, the main charge which the person is being pursued for uh, is, is uh, another cause of difficulty and complexity, which sometimes causes, I know, some concern to some stakeholders have identified, well, I don't see that offence actually appearing in, in the tables, and it's because it's been difficult to isolate it from uh, the main charge that the, the, the uh, accused has faced. So thank you for talking about appearing in the table. Given the t that tackling poaching is one of the priorities in the wildlife crime strategy, why does the report not present data on all types of poaching offences? Um, if there's anything specific, Camila, could you draw attention to anything that you're particularly concerned is not, not, not appearing well, in Well, we're report? talking about deer poaching. We're talking about uh, issues related to poaching on rivers. Uh, sometimes it's easier to catch river information, uh, less so on deer. Well, I certainly um, would acknowledge that uh, poaching is a, a serious, serious matter. Uh, and indeed, uh, in post Scotland, there's obviously some stakeholders for, for whom that is their principal issue of concern and is raised on a regular basis with us, uh, clearly members of SLE, Scottish Gamekeepers Association and Basque, uh, and the Deer, uh, uh, British Deer Society are very conscious of the, the level of crime, some of it unreported, uh, which is occurring across, across Scotland. So um, that is an issue that uh, we will we'll hope to improve data quality with, with stakeholders as we go on. But um, just... Clearly, game birds attention. are something which you know we're particularly interested in noting. Yes, indeed. Well, we um, obviously we have a number of challenges in terms of all forms of wildlife crime. Some of them relate to the the, the area in which the crime is taking place, and therefore the difficulty in actually finding any evidence. And indeed, people may not stumble across uh, a, a, a dead raptor because of the distances involved, and in, uh, perhaps the between the offence and where the bird dies. Uh, in other cases, crimes may go unreported because of a wall of silence I've referred to in previous occasions. Um, and in other uh, issues, it may just be that the, the, the tension has not been drawn to that crime. Um, but uh, Hugh Dignan, I believe, wanted to come in on a, a sure. point of technical detail. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Convene, I, I would just say that, it, I mean, in Table 1A, the where the... Uh, the first column says offences relating to, so uh, it has deer listed separately, has hunting with dogs, which is essentially coursing. Uh, it has the poaching and game laws, which is essentially uh, offences under the Wildlife and Countryside Act in, in, in relation to, to wild birds. Uh, and it has possession of salmon and trout, which is uh, the obviously salmon poaching and further salmon and freshwater fisheries offences. So they are broken down to that extent. Maybe they're not, it could be a bit more explicit in that column exactly what we're referring to, but I think that the different sorts of poaching offences are indeed shown Good. In, in Table 1A. Well, we'll look forward to seeing their presentation uh, such that uh, lay people can understand these things. Um, do you report, uh, why don't you report, on uh, the actual data on penalties for wildlife crime? Um, well, clearly, um, 
as I said earlier on in my opening remarks, uh, Camilla, there's sometimes there's, there's, there's difficulties in read across and, uh, already we were aware of between um, uh, the year in which an offence might be reported, the year in which an offence is then actually successfully prosecuted and indeed sentencing and penalties then arise. Uh, I, I take the point and we can obviously have a look at how uh, issues to do with penalties are reported in the report, um, but until we crack that particular problem about the read across between the offence being committed, the prosecution and indeed the sentence or, or penalty being applied, it may well not um, uh, tie in very well with the data as it's currently presented. So that would be something we'd need to heavily caveat so that people didn't conclude perhaps that um, you may have a situation in one year where you have fewer offences and you have penalties or, or sentences, which would obviously look uh, somewhat odd, e even, even uh, in the context of those of us who study these things closely. So we need to uh, obviously bear that in mind and make sure that it is actually intelligible and the point you made very fairly about the, the headings in terms of the uh, the, the, uh, how the charges are recorded. Similarly, we need to look at those kind of issues as well, about how we actually read across from one table to another and that people can understand uh, you know, the follow-through into a successful prosecution. Thank you very much. That leads us perfectly into detection of wildlife crime. Jim Hume. Yeah, just going on to detection of crime, uh, wildlife crime in particular, of course. Mark Avery from the Scottish Wildlife Trust thought and reported that uh, the discovery of such crimes are just the tip of the iceberg. And we pu pushed Police Scotland on that last year where they said that no, they didn't agree with that. It was much more than the, t the tip of the iceberg, um, not giving an exact figure, of course. It would be interesting, therefore, to find out what the Minister's view is on the detection of uh, wildlife crime. Are we detecting a vast majority or, or, or just a just a tip of the iceberg? Well, this, I think, is an extremely important issue that Mr Hume has raised. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of narrative around this area uh, in, on, online and, and indeed in person. And indeed, I've addressed it previously at uh, not this year's wildlife conference, but last year's wildlife conference, where I raised the point that we know there are areas of Scotland which are perfect habitat for hen harriers, golden eagles, other species of raptor, and indeed other wildlife, where they just aren't there. And there's no reasonable explanation as to why they're not there. Um, so uh, it's certainly an area where I would like to see more, more work done, more analysis, so that we can uh, get a better understanding of why that is the case. Uh, but clearly, I have a concern that perhaps in certain areas of the country where we are not seeing species that have perfect habitat available to them and they are just not appearing, there's something untoward maybe happening to them. Uh, we can't obviously uh, take it for granted that is the case. There could be other factors at play. Um, other natural uh, 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 causes of that situation, and so hence we need to, we need to do more work. But it's certainly something worth and worthy of investigation. Um, so, in respect, I did see um, uh, ACC Graham's comments uh, on this issue. My gut feel tells me that there are crimes being committed that are not being recorded, um, and that's not to criticise the police or any of the justice authorities. I think it's extremely difficult to detect in many cases crimes and some people go to great lengths to hide the evidence of their crimes and so they never come to court. Uh, so I think for that reason I believe there are more crimes being committed than we record now. I, I need to acknowledge that as the Minister but this is the best available data we have and therefore it's what we have to use to try and try and tackle the, the challenge but we need to be, I think all be mindful of the fact it may not be capturing every offence that's being, uh, being uh, uh, taken forward in, in Scotland at the moment and therefore we can't afford to be complacent even when we see relatively no numbers in case of poisonings and other crimes. And just to, to follow that on, I mean, just looking at how we do detect uh, or try and detect more wildlife crime, I mean, I appreciate you'll, you'll never uh, ever uh, be able to uh, find all, all the crime uh, due to the vast uh, areas of Scotland, but you mentioned there that there was areas where there was no explanation why there hadn't been a, re been a repopulation. Therefore, would there be a focus by Police Scotland or, 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 or officials on these areas uh, as a method of uh, increasing detection or other, other tools in the box that you could uh, use regarding uh, better detection rates? I, I think um, there, there are a number of different aspects to, to the point that Mr Hume raises. I think, first of all, you know, we can uh, work with SNH and other conservation bodies to understand if there, is there a, a natural reason why this is happening. Um, uh, obviously, the police and justice authorities may be aware that 
uh, from previous um, recorded instances, there may be a suggestion that in certain areas of the country that that there's a possibility, at the very least, there's a possibility that wildlife crime is being conducted. And I would certainly encourage, although I don't interfere in operational matters, certainly encourage the police to take that very seriously and, and to use whatever uh, tools they feel are available to them to, to uh, try and identify if a crime is being conducted. Um, but at the same time, we, we need to do more perhaps on, on the science and, and uh, the research through SNH and other uh, institutions to try and identify is there a natural reason for this or are there maybe changes in agricultural practice or things which are not messy offences but which are having an impact on on the the uh, prey that the the birds rely upon uh, and thereby the the uh, impact in terms of their numbers in that locality but we do have to be aware that there could be a wildlife crime that's uh, occurring and we have to trust uh, the police and other prosecution authorities that they will um, examine any evidence they do have and where necessary take forward a an investigation to, to discover if a crime is being conducted. Okay, and, and just to, f to finish up on that, um, there was some scientific evidence, uh, a study by Macmillan, which was published in Scottish Birds uh, in 2011, regarding uh, scientific studies of uh, populations of golden eagles, red kites, peregrines, hind harriers, and goss ha hawks, and the like. Uh, and that stated that there was um, a more illegal pr uh, persecution on those birds than was recorded. Uh, has the Minister thought about uh, actually putting some of that scientific uh, evidence into the report, even although it's not p detection and actual um, uh, cr crime found, but it's uh, scientific evidence suggesting that there is extra? Well, I, I, I haven't read the report that Mr Hume refers to, but I will certainly look it out myself and, and, and obviously have the chance to, to have a look at what is in it and see how relevant it could be to uh, the annual uh, wildlife crime report. Clearly, if it's a, if it's a p report that's conducted in a fixed point in time, it may not be as helpful to us in terms of an ongoing development of an annual report and therefore monitoring of trends, um, but certainly look to see if there's any messages in there that might be helpful in exploring what else we might try and capture in terms of uh, uh, evidence that might be suggestive of crime, even if we've not got any hard evidence. So. That's something worthy of worthy of examination, but um, I can't make any promises about future annual reports. It's something that's done in partnership with police, crown office, and other uh, other agencies. So we need to, to have a look at that in the round and, and take views from all involved in preparing the report as to the relevance of the information. Okay. Um, I don't know whether um, uh, Hugh Dignan has read that report. I don't know if you've got any knowledge of it. Um, um, I'm, sure. uh, I'm not sure that I've read the precise report that, that you mentioned, but there is. There have over the years been a number of reports which have suggested that the, the, the persecution is one of the factors which underlies uh, missing populations of, of a number of our raptor species. Uh, in terms of whether we can get that into the annual report, it might just be worth mentioning that the Poor Scotland Partnership has recently established a science group with um, one of the uh, purposes of, the, of, of establishing that group was to examine whether or not these sort of scientific reports could be used to help guide police investigations or, or to, to, to guide you know, law enforcement activities. And also we could use that, that information that's coming out of that in the annual report to help explain the position more generally and with regard to raptor persecution. Okay, that would be useful, thanks. Okay, okay Graham Day has got a supplementary. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kavira. It's specifically about the prosecution of wildlife crime. The figures in the report show that between 2008 and 2013, there were 1,554 wildlife crimes recorded, yet proceedings were taken in only around 19% of the cases. Now, now, whilst that figure did rise in 2012-2013 to 23%, and appreciating the difficulties which arise with detecting and pursuing certain types of wildlife crime. Would you not agree, Minister, that these figures at face value, at least, do leave one with the impression that the authorities are not taking wildlife crime as seriously as they ought to, albeit I realise that you do? Well, um, I, do, I do believe that, that uh, there's increased level of awareness of the public concern in wildlife crime. I think um, all the partners in Paw Scotland have taken very seriously recent incidents, certainly since I've been um, Minister, that I, I'm, I'm aware of the support we've had from around the table for tackling wildlife crime. Now, um, that's not to say that the response every time to every incident is perfect. There, there are some comments that have been made that I think have been unhelpful in, in recent times, but 
uh, I do believe that everybody, uh, certainly on the law enforcement community, is, is taking it seriously. But as to whether they could do more, um, you know, there clearly we uh, we have issued guidance through the Lord Advocate about using investigative tools. That's uh, with a sincere hope that um, we can give some support to the police to take perhaps use of techniques which might be kind of challenging to, to some in the community um, because we recognise the very great difficulty for certain types of wildlife crime, particularly those I think unfortunately involving raptors, where um, quite often even though you suspect a crime has taken place because the bird may have flown off from a, a poisoning site um, uh, and it can never be found. Um, uh, or at least, you know, somebody would be need searching for a needle in a haystack, effectively, to try and find a uh, deceased raptor uh, when they've got a wide range that they may have flown flown to before uh, before dying, depending on the substance that's been used or whether they've been shot or or, or injured in some other way. Um, it may always be difficult to get sufficient forensic evidence to be able to prosecute, um, but clearly we are stepping up our efforts uh, through SASA in terms of the forensic evidence, you now developing uh, DNA tools to be able to identify if a trap, even if there's no body present, a trap may have been used to uh, trap or injure a, a protected bird, such as a red kite, um, um, or, or indeed hen harrier. These are very iconic species and ones we are very keen to protect. Um, so we are making steps forward, and these are things which are being pu pushed forward by the agency, saying we, we think we can do this. Clearly, as uh, Mr Dignan has pointed out, the science group on Post Scotland Bulb, that's another aspect of looking how we can strengthen the evidential trail, how we can uh, make it easier to secure a prosecution. Uh, and it's not just on raptors. There are obviously other wildlife crimes that may be difficult to trace, but um, it tends to be the case... I guess for the point that was made earlier on by the convener, um, that uh, you know some crimes are easier to detect. You catch someone poaching; it's you know uh, it's a fair cop gov. Um, you know uh, it's it's going to be easier to 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 secure a prosecution uh, than somebody who may have laid poison bait in a very discreet location and uh, and have killed a bird uh, as a consequence. But it's something I'm very aware of. It's I think we're trying to make the report more explicit so that it has that impact where people start to apply a little bit of perhaps um, constructive pressure uh, to, to improve performance across the sphere, not just the agencies but government as well. And I think that's a healthy thing. That's what the report is there to do. So we're looking at uh, issues related to additional measures such as the uh, general licence. Uh, Minister, do you think that the restriction on general licences to control corvids will be an effective sanction? Uh, and when will it uh, still be possible for an affected estate or licensee or with a general licence restriction to apply for an individual one? Um, well, on the first point about whether I think it will be effective, um, in, in truth, time will tell whether it has been effective. But we have designed, uh, we've got relatively few options available to us in terms of interventions we can take. Um, clearly, I have signalled that if this regime, the new regime with general licence provision does not work, I have signalled to, to stakeholders that it's in their interest to make it work because we may have to contemplate options which would be um, uh, perhaps of a more general nature rather than the targeted approach we're trying to take with the general licence provision. We are trying to target the impact of, of this measure on those uh, areas of land where we believe there are issues rather than trying to hit all um, all businesses, including ones that are acting very fairly and and um, and delivering on their conservation obligations uh, with with you know perfect degree of of um, uh, vol voluntary voluntary action without being compelled to do so. So we're trying to be proportionate by taking a target approach. I hope uh, that it is taken seriously. I know there has been some concern expressed that perhaps this is purely an administrative exercise and 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 it's easy for. Uh, uh, land managers then to to get a license through another route to get an individual species license and there is provision obviously for an SNH2 issue uh, an individual license uh, if someone's had their general license withdrawn for them to then apply for on a case by case basis um, which will increase the hassle involved in doing so but there's no guarantee that SNH would issue a license unless they think there's good justification for doing so perhaps in order to protect a, a, another species a curlew or wading bird perhaps that needs protection from um, from its eggs being destroyed by, by corvids or or another uh, bona fide reason why that licence should be granted. As I said in my opening remarks, general licence is a privilege, it's not a right. Um, we have in the past trusted people on a 
universal basis across Scotland that they can be trusted. It's clear from the nature of wildlife crime across Scotland that there may be some uh, individual land holdings where we can no longer trust um, the uh, activities that are going on there to be done fairly and, and use a general licence appropriately. So uh, it's been necessary to take this step. We know that these uh, licences will be publicised uh, in the SNH website. Is that something that's going to be updated monthly? I, well, obviously we haven't had the first one yet, convener, but um, we can obviously get some feedback from SNH on, on their proposals there. But I would imagine as cases are added, they would be, they would be added um, on, a, on a live basis. So, um, so the public can be assured that uh, they should get fairly speedy information about this? That, that would be my, my hope and serious intent that that information is provided. I think a reputational driver, as with vicarious liability, it's one of the most significant aspects of the vicarious liability provision, is its reputational impact on the, on the uh, land holding and the owner of the land holding. Uh, and I think that reputational driver should be, should be used. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson wants a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Minister morning. and uh, colleagues. Uh, Really, just to kind of follow up on this general principle that's involved here, the balance of probabilities rather than beyond all reasonable doubt, you know, the, the criminal civil law level of proof, and, and touching a wee bit on the previous uh, question as well, where, um, you know, it's clear it's very difficult to get the evidence for some of these crimes, especially the likes of the poisoning and so on, much easier if you have water bailiffs on the edge of a river cut and somebody poaching, so that it, it, it's... It's difficult to get the evidence, and one of the points that was raised last week with the, the, the Procurator Fiscal Service was, and, and the police, that given that it's so difficult, um, can we be assured that the people prosecuting and, and the police themselves will always sort of go that extra mile to, to push this because the difficulty might discourage them from coming forward with it? police reporting to the fiscal or the fiscal saying, OK, we've, we've got a case here that they should always sort of um, try to sort of push the bounds, if you like, you know, to, to ensure that we do get these cases into court. Because even if they lose a case in court, there would be sufficient evidence, possibly, from a criminal case that would allow you to take action under the likes of the licence provisions because your, your, your burden of proof would be the balance of probabilities rather than the um, beyond all reasonable doubt which a criminal case would require. So it's just to get your own view on whether um, it should be almost as a matter of course the police should be going forward, possibly um, when... With other crimes, they might say, well, I, we don't have enough evidence here, and the fiscal should also take the case to court, even if they feel they don't have enough for the criminal, because it then gives ammunition to you in relation to this. Well, um, I, I recognise the, the points that have been made in respect of um, the, the, the challenge that there is. I suppose it's worth stepping back and saying that in terms of the criminal burden of proof, we would have been talking about perhaps prosecution of an individual that we could prove had committed the crime. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, you know, that might be possible if you, if you have a trap which is tagged now for the individual who's laid it and it's, and it's got DNA evidence of a bird that's, or indeed a corpse, has, is found in the trap and it may be possible to connect that uh, offence of, of using a trap to, to, to uh, kill a, a protected wild bird. But in most cases, it, you may well find, say, poisoning and a, and a dead bird on a land holding, and you could be reasonably confident the poisoning took place, perhaps, on that land holding, and the bird died in that land holding as a result. Uh, and therefore, it's possible to say, with the civil burden of proof, that um, uh, you know that, that that in all likelihood a crime has taken place on that land holding, but not be able to pin it on an individual that would be, enable you to secure a criminal conviction. So I think this gives more flexibility to, um, to SNH in circumstances where it's been impossible to prove a particular individual was responsible for the poisoning or the shooting of a, a bird, um, but that that bird definitely, in the, or at least in the, in the eyes of the, the authorities, most likely there was a wildlife crime committed on that land, um, uh, and, and therefore they're, they're those responsible for managing that land have been... Uh, involved, but we can't pin. There may be several different general licences on, on one landholding, but you know for certain uh, that that landholding 
um, or as best we can do with the civil burden of proof that, that land holding has, has had a crime committed on it and therefore um, the general licence provision w would kick in. Um, but as to the point about whether the police or the, the, the authorities should take forward a, a prosecution um, if they're unsure that they can secure a, a criminal conviction against an individual in the hope that that will then strengthen the case for S&H, um, I suppose any prosecution decision or prosecution is obviously a matter for the Crown Office, mm -hmm. Procurator Fiscal Service and, and indeed uh, in liaison with the police. But I, I would give comment is that there is an information sharing protocol that will be in place between the police and S&H and that would be regular meetings and if they feel they have evidence of, uh, that they believe they're fairly confident a, a crime has taken place on a particular land holding that that will be shared with SNH. SNH can then take a decision uh, on restriction of the general licence uh, in that case. Um, but we've got to be very careful um, to make clear to people that the general licence applies to the land holding, not to the individual. And if you're looking for a criminal conviction, then you have to have a criminal burden of proof, um, which is beyond reasonable doubt, as you quite rightly say, that you can prove that individual uh, has committed a crime. And this is, a, I think, a, a still a fairly rigorous burden of proof in terms of civil burden of proof, but it's, it's one that uh, allows us to have some options where we can't prove which individual was involved, mm -hmm. um, but we can be certain uh, to, to, to the civil burden of proof <coughs> level at least that, um, uh, that a crime has taken place. Yeah, well, th thank you very much, Minister, for that. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, obviously, we have to be careful because we don't want injustices to take place. We don't want exactly. um, pe landholders, you know, um, being unduly penalised for something that that isn't their their um, you know that they haven't they haven't done and it's maybe easier where you've got massive land holdings uh, you know and something right in the centre of it uh, appears but if you've got lots of relatively smaller la you know land holdings very difficult to to pin that down and, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear what you're saying there um, the in terms of the the what you were saying about cases then um, so there will be an automatic procedure will there that where where the police get a, a complaint investigate something but maybe feel they can't put it to the fiscal because they don't have sufficient evidence that they would be duty bound would they to pass that to SNH or is it is there a protocol set up to ensure that cases that don't progress to the fiscal but where there is because there's not enough for a criminal case mm -hmm. would automatically go to SNH well, certainly there will be an information sharing protocol and uh, with the, with the police, and so therefore we we would hope that the information would be supplied if, if for whatever reason the Crown Office believe a criminal conviction can't be secured, um, uh, then the police would share the information they have with with S N H uh, on the basis that there may be a possibility that you know if they're if they're comfortable that they believe uh, in the terms of a civil, a civil burden of proof that um, as I say that they they are reasonably confident a wildlife crime has been committed, that they can uh, provide that to SNH. SNH can then take a decision as to whether they believe that the case is strong enough to remove the general licence. Um, it's worth pointing out that, you know, and it's an important part of the process, that people will have a right of appeal. Um, and I think that natural justice, that's important, that uh, people do have a right of appeal um, to make their case, to, to explain why they feel um, the, that would removal of general license would be unjustified, but um, I would hope that uh, you know that uh, the information sharing protocol would mean that SNH have a fairly solid solid case before they even contemplate taking that forward, and um, then the, hopefully there will be if they believe it's necessary to apply a general license restriction, that they would um, ha be reasonably confident they would be able to with, uh, withstand any appeal uh, and uh, s secure that move. But I think the we, we can't can't obviously force the police to provide information, but I am confident that the police will will be collaborative and and uh, will indeed have an interest in seeing wildlife crime stamped out. Uh, they certainly um, always indicate a desire to do that, and uh, I would hope that this would be a useful tool to all the justice authorities um, to um, send a signal that uh, you know where perhaps it's been un unable to secure a criminal conviction. It's still um, there are sanctions that can be applied where we're confident that a wildlife crime has taken place. And I would hope that ultimately will help the police by deterring people from committing these crimes in the first place and making their life easier in the long run.
You'll not be surprised that there are several supplementaries in this interesting no area. Uh, first, Jim Hume, then Alec Ferguson. Thanks, convener. I, I'm just wondering at the the rationale to, um, ha, you know, make it more difficult to to control corvids in, in certain areas, and wonder if that's an unintended quen consequence of that could be actually detrimental to some uh, bird species. Uh, obviously. Corvids are. <laughs> I've, I've had personal experience of, of helping black grouse, and some one of the main problems with the corv uh, getting the black grouse numbers up were uh, actually hooded or carrion crows uh, taking the eggs off the off the black grouse. So there is plenty of evidence out there that uh, controlling corvids to a reasonable level helps all wildlife. So <coughs> I'm interested in the rationale of um, actually um, restricting. Uh, the control of corvids, which could actually have a detri detrimental effect you know, quite badly on quite a few bird species. Uh, also interested in, uh, just to put all my little questions together, is um, is it the land or the individual uh, that you'd be restricting and would have to license? Obviously, um, if you own a piece, of, a piece of land in a town and somebody has a crime on it, it's not the the, the person that owns the owns the, the land that <laughs> is uh, hold libelous. So how would that work? Uh, does or would it be the as I said, would it be the land that would be have to be licensed, or it would it be the individual that there was uh, actual um, uh, a balance of probabilities uh, that, that there'd been a crime committed? Well, um, on the issue about corvids. Uh, it's, it's certainly true to say that we are aware that corvids can have an impact on a number of species, clearly have an impact on livestock in, in some cases, and uh, we're well aware of that. It's important to stress we are not saying that um, uh, you know, general licence means there is no route for uh, a land manager to control uh, a species such as corvids. If there's a good justification for doing so, they will just have the, the privilege, if you like, of, of being trusted to control a number of species without any really serious degree of scrutiny of that in the past mm -hmm. um, uh, having been applied removed from them and they will have to apply for a species license species by species if they want to control corvids they apply for a license to control corvids and they'll have to make the case now if there's a good case to be made for conservation grounds or to protect livestock then clearly that's something that SNH would take into consideration and where reasonable cases are made in respect of a number of different species to control the species uh, SNH have always been uh, uh, you know, supportive of, of uh, applicants when they make a, a bona fide application. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to just take it on trust that people can control uh, a number of different species anymore uh, without having to go through a little bit more scrutiny and to make life a little bit more difficult for them, uh, to be honest, uh, in reflection of the fact that on that land holding uh, we have ev sufficient evidence to believe a wildlife crime has taken place at the civil burden of proof level. So. I think, um, you know, uh, to reassure Mr. Hume and to reassure those who are, are concerned about that control of corvids issue, if there's a bona fide reason and on conservation grounds it can be justified or livestock, protection of livestock, then they can still apply for a licence. We're just not going to give it to them um, as if, you know, by magic that they can control uh, as many species uh, under the terms of general licence as they like without any degree of scrutiny of the method they're going to use and the, and, and the, 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 the objectives they're trying to achieve in controlling the corvids. As to the issue about the, the land uh, holding itself and the fairness of taking this approach, um, you know, we, as I've said to, to Mr. Thompson, you know, there's, there's a challenge in terms of uh, you know, using the, the, the criminal burden proof. You, you have to identify the, absolute, the individual, and there obviously vicarious liability kicks in if it's the, the employer then has employed that person who's then committed the, committed the criminal offence. Um, in this situation, we need a tool that helps us where we are confident enough to say a wildlife crime has taken place, but we can't pin it on any individual. Um, and uh, we need to reflect that in that general area land, we can't prove which individual who may have and their own general license has committed the offence. Uh, and so therefore, unfortunately for those who are innocent, uh, we have to uh, place a restriction on that land holding. But then obviously, as I say, licenses can be applied for to control individual species. So we're not, it's not a, absolute stop on control and genuine grounds for control of, of uh, uh, whether it's uh, you know, corvids or other species, but we just have to have additional scrutiny where we can no longer trust um, those operating in that landholding to do so uh, legitimately. Mm -hmm. 
Good grief. Yeah. Um, no, that would be quite concerning for a lot of people out there, I, I'm sure. Uh, and just to clarify, I mean, you are only talking about licensing uh, to control corvides where there has been a, a, a balance of probability uh, concern regarding wildlife crime. Is that just to clarify that? We're talking about the general licence, mm -hmm. the privilege of having a general licence which allows a, a, a land holding effectively to control a number of different species without any degree of real scrutiny as to the purpose, the techniques, the, uh, and it's, it's I suppose it, in, in truth it's similar to other forms of regulation where we've tried to take an approach whereby we are um, you know, being proportionate and in this case, where we have reason to believe a land holding has had a wildlife crime committed on it, um, we feel it's entirely fair that a privilege, which has been to trust people in the past uh, with a very light form, uh, touch form of regulation, is removed and that we put in place a slightly more rigorous form of regulation to ensure that uh, we can be confident that the techniques being deployed are being used properly uh, in accordance with the law and that non-target species are not being captured in these uh, these traps and and other mm -hmm. techniques. So I think it's entirely proportionate and reasonable to do this. As I say, for those who uh, Mr. Hume uh, suggests might be concerned, um, you know, I, I believe that uh, you know, we have a, uh, an appeals process, so if they're able to come forward with good evidence as to the fact that they were not responsible for what happened, um, <coughs> then that would be something that SNH, I'm sure, would look at. Uh, the appeals process is there for a reason, so we're not automatically assuming because the evidence comes forward and, and the general licence is proposed that, that that person is automatically guilty. They've got a chance to, uh, sorry, the land holding, if, if you like, has been auto automatically deemed to have been guilty of an offence. So they, they are given the chance to contradict the evidence if they can do so and and therefore you know a different decision might arise and that proposal might be withdrawn to remove the general licence. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are checks and balances in there. We are conscious of the need to be proportionate and to be fair to people in this situation. But if after all of that it's still concluded that in all likelihood a wildlife crime has taken place, I don't think it's unreasonable to make life a little bit more challenging for people uh, and to, to apply a bit more scrutiny to what they do. So, uh, sorry, I was, ju I was just going yeah, to get an absolute cl clarity oh, um, and appreciate what you, you've all said, but you, you're not talking about a general licensing to control corvides on, on areas where there's no evidence at all of any wildlife crime. You're only talking about where there's a balance of probability issue. In, indeed, yeah, it's nah, not, um, you know, that, yeah, it's clear. the land, it's the land holding and where, where it's believed to be a, a crime has committed rather than, you know, yeah. every single land holding of that particular individual, if that's the point you're trying to... I just to, to make that clear on the record yeah. in case there's any concerns otherwise. Thank you. Not at all. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry in a way to prolong this, but I think this is a quite an important part of these discussions. Uh, I must admit I have got concerns about the ability to introduce fairly punitive measures uh, without having established an incontrovertible burden of proof. But I hear what the Minister says and I, I'm willing to go with that as far as, I, as, uh, as far as it goes for the time being. But there is an aspect of this which does slightly concern me. I, I don't think anybody can argue that every incident of wildlife crime brings with it uh, an almost increased, an almost increasing atmosphere of, of accusation and speculation um, from both sides, if you like, um, uh, and there's been evidence of that in, in, in the Russia incident of, of all sorts of speculative um, accusations being made. And I, I, I'm sure the Minister would agree that this does nothing to lessen tension between NGOs, charitable organisations and land management organisations and representatives as well. Does he not feel, as I think I'm beginning to think, that this measure will do very little to reduce that tension and reduce that type of speculation um, that I don't think does the argument any favours at all? Um, whereas, uh, and because I, I kind of feel that this measure is likely to exacerbate that sort of activity, um, particularly through social media, which of course now plays such a large part in this. And I just wonder what the Minister's thoughts are on that. Well, certainly, if I can say at the outset, I, I also share uh, Mr. Ferguson's concerns that sometimes um, I, you know, there's a need for, for cool heads um, when, when things happen. I completely uh, appreciate the, the concern when any such incident occurs, but as we've seen, um, it, it's not helpful to the police investigation to have uh, theories, random theories out there about what has happened. Uh, and indeed, you know, I have to be very careful as a minister not to comment on what I know 
um, uh, I've received from, from the police in regard to a, a case, because it could prejudice the investigation. So I think there's a responsibility in everybody uh, to behave uh, sensibly, um, not denying that people are going to be angry. I've been very angry when I've, I've seen some of the incidents that have happened where I'm very confident a crime has been committed. Um, but you have to still hold yourself back on, and wait for the investigation to, to come up with the evidence. But on the point about um, whether general licences might exacerbate this, this already tense situation, which I acknowledge, I would hope it actually might have the potential to, to do the opposite. Um, I think a lot of the frustration that ha occurs around wildlife crime is because people feel there's no sanction and people are, are perhaps beyond, beyond the reach of the law in some cases because of the difficulty in, in proving definitively that an individual has committed a crime. And that by having a, a, a new tool in the, in the armoury uh, to be able to tackle wildlife crime, that may give people some confidence that if, even if a criminal conviction of an individual might not be possible, at least some uh, sanction is in place to make uh, sure that it's less likely such a crime will occur again because of the increased scrutiny that would come with removal of a general licence and the, the need to demonstrate quite clearly there's a conservation purpose or a need to protect livestock behind the use of a species-specific licence. And so I think, you know, that hopefully will create a slightly more constructive uh, atmosphere. People think there is a, a route to remedy the situation if a crime has sus been suspected in a particular locality and they will then trust the police to conduct their investigation if they're unable to secure a criminal conviction uh, but they are confident a crime has taken place. They obviously through information protocol would supply that to SNH and SNH if they are similarly convinced of the case can remove the general licence. So at least there is something there that may help uh, address the challenge. I should also mention, as I said in my opening remarks, that Professor Pousty is looking at environmental penalties as well, uh, and uh, clearly uh, whether they are sufficiently a deterrent uh, is one of the key considerations. Uh, but I would hope we can uh, see this having to be applied very rarely. If it works as a deterrent and people realise actually this would be a serious bugbear for us to have to go through uh, additional hoops to, to get a species-specific licence. They may well, it may well just uh, encourage them not to commit the crime in the first place. Um, I certainly hope so. I hope we're not having to wade through reams of general licence restrictions being uh, posted on the website. But uh, if, if, if needed, then so be it. Well, uh, just a very, very brief comment, if I may, convener. Thank you. I, I absolutely understand what the minister said, and I, I, I share his his hopes for the the outcome. But I do think there is a potential there for this measure to to increase, if you like, unfounded speculative um, accusations, uh, particularly through social media, uh, that could be, um, if you like, prompted by a desire to see action taken against a particular organisation or individual, when actually the burden of proof just doesn't exist. But I, I hope yeah. I'm wrong and I hope you're proved right. Well, well, well if I can just reassure um, Mr Ferguson on one point, I, I take very seriously the issue of having to have a proper evidential trail. I don't think there's going to be trial by social media of any individual. I, I, I trust entirely the police and SNH to look uh, very sincerely at the evidence and if they don't feel there's a strong enough case you know, to, to, to take forward, then they would not take that forward. But Equally, if they do feel there's a strong case, I would very much hope they do take it forward as a means of trying to stamp out this activity. But I, I'm not an advocate of trial by social media, believe me. Politicians uh, need to tread very carefully in terms of trial by social media, of course. Dave. Thank you, Convener. Just a small point, uh, Minister. Will the stats in future reports offer a read across then in this area so that when a, a recorded crime or multiple recorded crimes uh, result in the revocation of a general licence. Will we see something there uh, that allows us to get a more accurate picture of clear up rates for a one of a better expression? I, that's an entirely reasonable point, and uh, if I may convene, I think we'll, we'll have a think about how we could work that into the report and maybe come back to the committee as to how uh, we can reflect uh, any such evidence that in any cases that have been taken for uh, through the general licence restriction, because uh, obviously that would be a first time we're reporting in the annual mm -hmm. report. Uh, how that could be worked into the statistics to give a read across, as, as the member asked. Okay, thank you. I think I must try and draw this particular bit to a close, but, uh, you know, to uh, l make sure that we don't have speculation about particular crimes, but nevertheless the statistics that led to the creation of the Wildlife Act in its first place, which is that there have been several dozen, to put it mildly, convictions 
for these kinds of crimes in the last 15 to 20 years, which have led the uh, authorities and the government to actually create this law. So we're not talking about speculation in terms of, um, uh, you know, the fact that these things have happened. They have. It is uh, obviously something which, you know, we don't map every year. But when we're trying to deal with trends, I don't think these facts should be forgotten. Indeed, Camino, if I may just add one very brief point that, um, you know, I, I don't go into these measures lightly. Um, I certainly listened to voices when I first became Minister of Environment and Climate Change that were saying that, uh, you know, th things were on a downward trend, you know, we don't have to, to worry. But unfortunately, in the middle of last uh, last year, so it's slightly, um, longer than that ago, we were, were already seeing evidence that fences were increasing again. And I do take, um, you know, some heart from, from those progressive voices that are across the land management sector who are really trying very hard, I think, to uh, to win over those within the wider population, but unfortunately there are those who will not listen to their progressive voices and who will continue to commit wildlife crime, and I think we do have to be realistic about that. Um, as I said, we've tried to target measures rather than have uh, measures which affect everybody um, equally, when you know the, the innocent and the guilty. We've tried to uh, target measures which will have an impact on those who are committing these crimes and committing unacceptable practices in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, I really do hope we don't have to go beyond that, but um, we may have to contemplate that in future. OK, thank you. Uh, to another question from Angus MacDonald. Thanks, uh, Karina. Good morning, Minister. Morning. Um, you, f following on from your uh, comments regarding a, a review of, of wildlife crime uh, penalties to establish if the Act is a, a sufficient deterrent, um, you, you've just mentioned that Professor uh, Pousty is uh, leading a review of wildlife crime uh, and that the review um, was due to report in uh, December. Now, um, the report states that uh, a group has been set up to conduct the review of wildlife crime penalties and expects to report back in late 2014, and Police Scotland will use the appropriate investigative tools at their disposal to investigate crime scenes. Now, last week, DCS Robbie Allen stated that um, a, the group would review wildlife crime penalties, but it would hold its first meeting in November uh, 2014. Um, is there any reason why it's taken so long for the review of wildlife crime penalties to, to begin work? And uh, will the review still be completed by December, as you told the Parliament in May this year? Um, I, I believe uh, Mr Macdonald may have uncovered an error in the report. <laughs> um, uh, there have been uh, four or five meetings of, of the, the group, so uh, we will have to look closely at the error you've uncovered. That may, apologies for any misleading information there. Uh, it is true to say the report has slipped somewhat. We believe it will be early in the new year rather than December. Um, but Professor Pousty is, is working um, very well in terms of delivering that report and confident we will we'll get report uh, relatively soon, but it may slip in slightly into the new year. Um, it's worth also stating that in the commitment I gave in the, the chamber to, to, uh, to Claire Baker in the wild, recent wildlife crime debate that we um, have asked Professor Pousty to take on the task of undertaking a desk review of uh, regimes uh, in terms of management of um, uh, shooting activity, sporting activity, uh, which was a commitment I gave in that debate, and, and Professor Pousey has agreed to do that, but that will be um, after he uh, completes the report of, uh, of the penalties, because that's the, obviously the immediate priority. OK, thanks. So just for clarification, um, the review has been underway for some time, and the first meeting wasn't in November. Indeed. Uh, maybe if I could ask uh, uh, Mr Dignan just to clarify when the, or, or, or indeed Karen, to clarify when the first meeting took place, because I wasn't conscious of the specific dates. Um, I'm slightly embarrassed. I do sit on the review committee, but I can't remember when the first meeting was, but it was certainly several months ago, uh, okay. probably in the summer. I yeah, think it was June. June, possibly. We, uh, we, we can confirm that in writing. Yeah, that we, we, can, we can get you details of, of the meetings when they were held um, to, to give you a more complete picture. But apologies for the, for the error in the report. Okay, Can thanks. Well, that's certainly more encouraging than the information that we received last week. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have a follow on from this from Graham Day. Uh, uh, yes, thank, thank you, Convener. I, I note your comments at the outset um, about an imminent announcement of the pesticide disposal scheme. So I, so I recognise you may not wish to give too much detail on that. To the committee today, but can I ask uh, how long such an amnesty might run for, and uh, more importantly, uh, 
would the penalties for possession of things like carbofurin be part of Professor Posty's review? Because it strikes me that if you offer an amnesty, the penalties, penalties that are then in place thereafter should be severe. Well, um, certainly I, I, I note Mr Day's comments and I have some sympathy with the point that um, I think when people are given an opportunity to remove such, uh, such pesticides from, from circulation, uh, that the, the, the justice authorities should note that they, they did not take the opportunity to remove them thereafter. Um, but just to be clear, um, we obviously expect to be announcing details of the scheme very shortly, as I said at the outset. Uh, the scheme will not be an amnesty as such, um, it's important to make that distinction, but it will allow controlled and safe disposal of substances which are obtained, uh, contained in the schedule of the possession of pesticides, Scotland Order 2005, and there's a defined list of, of okay. substances there. Uh, these, just for, for the record, are um, aldicarb, alpha chlorolose, alum, aluminium phosphide, uh, bendiocarb, carbofurin, which is the main uh, vehicle by which birds are poisoned, unfortunately, uh, mevinfos, sodium cyanide and strychnine. Um, it is an offence to even possess mm -hmm. uh, these at present, and they are most commonly used substances relating to poisoning offences. Um, th it's worth say saying in response to Mr Day as well, there's two principal aims of, of the proposed package, and we will give more detail in, in due course, uh, clearly, uh, but to get highly dangerous toxic substances out of the environment, and I think everybody, including the justice authorities, recognise that is a very important objective. Mm -hmm. um, and second, to remove any possibility of someone claiming in future that they had these poisons because they had not had an opportunity to get rid of them. And uh, therefore, I very much sympathise with the point, as I said earlier, uh, with Mr Day's point, that, that you know, working in partnership with uh, those involved in the land management sector uh, and uh, sporting interests to make sure that's communicated as widely as possible, that opportunity. If it's not been taken up, then I think we have to read into that perhaps that um, it may not be definitively the case, but there may have been a desire to avoid giving up these substances. So I would hope the authorities would certainly investigate that aspect of it if it came to it. But in terms of the penalties, Minister, would there be significant penalties in place for somebody who was found guilty of that? Um, I, I can't say at this moment in time, it's clearly a matter uh, not only for myself but for Crown Office, for Lord Advocate and, and indeed I would obviously have to wait and see uh, you know, what Professor Pousty comes forward with in terms of the existing penalties as to whether he believes they're sufficiently rigorous. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to come back to the committee obviously in, in light of the, 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 the forthcoming announcement with more detail on that if we feel we can tie in with the, the Crown Office and the Lord Advocate their, their own views on that issue. Okay, thank you. Very good. Another question from Claudia Beamish. Thanks, Claudia. And uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning. Uh, uh, could, I, could I just very briefly say that, um, more generally, that I, I do believe that the, the work that's being done um, by yourself and by, um, by the whole range of partners has really focused um, minds in Scotland on, on what you have described as a stain on Scotland's reputation and, and positive about moving that forward. Um, and just turn quite specifically to one area, which is um, uh, video, um, use of video in evidence. And obviously detection in remote um, rural areas, as we all know, is extremely difficult. And we heard last week from the, stake, from the evidence that we received from the panel about the range of investigative tools. Um, and um, ACC uh, Malcolm Graham d explained the position on video evidence. And I don't want to go into a great deal of detail because it was um, explained last week and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know it well, but there is the concern that it requires authorization from senior police officers and must be done in accordance with human rights legislation, which is absolutely right. Um, but then we move on to um, if other organizations or, or members of the public are um, you, taking video evidence um, that the um, Crown Prosecution um, Service, uh, sorry, the um, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service did explain that Scots law can admit evidence obtained irregularly um, and that there's no problem if a farmer um, takes um, a film on, on his or her own land um, on, on mobile phone but um, becomes complicated if it's not on their own land. Um, so in, in view of the remoteness um, and in access accessibility of places where there's crime, could, could you comment at all on that? Um, uh, and then I'd like a brief supplementary on it, depending on your answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not to preempt things, but it's a slightly different tack as well. 
Well, I, I certainly uh, well thank thank um, Claudia Beamish for her uh, remarks about the the work that's been done because I'm sure appreciated by not just by myself but everyone involved in in uh, taking forward these issues. Um, clearly, I, I very much I agree with uh, Claudia Beamish that one of the biggest challenges we face is the remoteness and rurality of where these offences are being in large part committed. Uh, we have to recognise police resources are stretched um, as they always have been. Uh, in policing rural areas because uh, of the geography of those areas and therefore it's difficult to have an officer in place to then provide um, you know, eyewitness evidence of a crime being committed. Um, I think it was significant that the Lord Advocate you know, gave um, guidance to the police to use all investigative tools, uh, which is I think the direct quote. Um, that did obviously include video surveillance. Uh, I am aware clearly of the, the concerns that were raised by, by Malcolm Graham last week in terms of the uh, ensuring it's uh, it's compliant with the legislation, uh, RIPSA legislation, and, and um, uh, in, in particular just the, uh, the human rights aspects of that, and, and clearly the, the example given um, by Miss Beamish of you know a farmer perhaps willingly having cameras in his land is is, is clearly one which wouldn't fall foul of that because. The, we should recognise that many land managers are very sympathetic to conservation issues and they may be concerned to protect um, a bird's nest from egg theft or um, from, from nest disturbance themselves and be quite willing to collaborate on that basis. But we also have a situation where clearly many land managers, or not many, I should be careful about that, but some land managers may be um, resistant to having any surveillance on their land and that pl places the police in a difficult position. But clearly if they have some evidence that they believe a crime is being committed, then that strengthens the argument that they may have for, for with uh, uh, getting permission to use uh, video surveillance evidence. And I, I would hope that they would have political support from across the chamber for doing so. Um, it's very difficult, obviously, for any minister, especially myself, to, 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 to uh, and I wouldn't want to, to be seen to be interfering in policing operation, operational issues. Um, but... Uh, I think I've tr tried to make clear the concern that it is difficult to prosecute and we need every resource available to be used uh, to, to catch people uh, committing these crimes. Um, we, I would just, for the record, say we only uh, are, are we're not asking for indiscriminate use of video surveillance, but for it to be used in appropriate and proportional uh, situations where, as I say, there's good cause to believe, perhaps on past performance, that, uh, that a land a land manager um, or their staff are, are committing wildlife crimes. Uh, and on the issue of third party video surveillance, I, I, I maybe take advice from, from uh, Hugh Dignan on, on this. I believe there is a case which is looking at the admissibility of third party uh, video surveillance evidence in Scotland at this moment. So I don't want to prejudice the outcome, but clearly we'll be looking uh, to see what comes from that in terms of the, the judgment as to whether that is admissible. There's a slightly different situation in England because the legislative framework is different and, and so we have to see it in the context of the laws that apply in Scotland. Um, but it's clearly an area that we're taking a lot of interest in because um, for the reasons that Claudia Beamish has cited, the difficulty in actually securing a conviction is, uh, ties in with Mr Day's point um, about the um, perception of the inability to secure a, a prosecution is something we have a concern uh, and I'm sure the police and Crown Office, uh, Procurator Fiscal Service also share that concern to be seen to be getting getting results. Right, thank you. Um, very, very briefly, thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, do you, do you think that there is the opportunity through Paul Scotland perhaps to increase public awareness of what they can and can't do, or maybe that work is actually going on already, but uh, people don't necessarily know what, what, they, what the options are? I could just clarify, Camille, uh, uh, just with uh, Ms Beamish, is it the uh, investigative options that you, you believe that we should clarify? Yes, if, if, if somebody in the public um, is, is aware that something's going on, what would they actually yeah. be able to do and how would they go through reporting it? Not without, without asking for the detail of it, of course, at, at this point, but just mm. how, how is that awareness being raised in, in, rural, yeah. in rural Scotland? Well, um, I, I think, thanks for the clarification, I, I, th I think that is an important point. We've obviously tried through Post Scotland uh, and 
got an excellent uh, media advisor in Louise Batchelor, who's uh, who's obviously had an influence with the, the media working uh, subgroup of the uh, Paw Scotland um, grouping to look at various approaches. Obviously, in terms of communications through the media, we try and emphasise uh, technological breakthroughs such as the uh, rollout of DNA evidence. And the point I was referring to earlier that SASA now have the techniques to be able to uh, prove that a trap has has been used to capture a, 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 a protected species such as a hen harrier or a red kite. And obviously, over time, we'd hope that that DNA profile would expand to other species. Um, the, the Paw Scotland have a, now an app for, for mobile phones which actually gives guidance to people as to um, you know, what evidence to collect. Um, that's helpful in terms of informing the public and, and not to disturb evidence very importantly when they find it because that could actually contaminate a site and make it more difficult to secure a prosecution. And uh, you know, we are, uh, I take the point that perhaps we can uh, make more explicit what full range of perhaps not giving too much detail away to uh, potential um, criminals, of course, but the generality of the kind of tools that could be used just to make them aware they could be on a candid camera at some point, and uh, that, that would perhaps be a deterrent effect in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to move on to wildlife incidents this uh, year. <laughs> Dave Thompson. Uh, and... Uh, this has already been mentioned very helpfully by Alex Ferguson, the, the incident uh, on the Black Isle um, with the, the red kites and, and, and the buzzards, and you mentioned it briefly yourself. You're always very helpful, Alex, yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned it yourself, Minister, a wee bit earlier as well, and uh, you'll be um, very well aware of the, the press release the police put out on the 24th of October, which... Um, caused a bit of a, of a stir and uh, I, I think maybe, um, you know, uh, more speculation than was certainly intended. And uh, when we talked to the police last week, they, they were making clear that they, were, they had chosen their words very carefully and had said that it was most likely um, not targeted deliberately, but that the birds were the victims of pest control measures. And... You also stated earlier that you're very concerned and angry about the rumours. And, of course, um, with a situation like this, there are lots of rumours flying around and some of them not so um, helpful. I just wonder if, if you would like to comment in a bit more detail about just where the police investigation is, insofar as you, you can, and... Um, in particular about the, the statement that um, 16 of the birds, uh, and there were 22 altogether, so we don't know what happened to the other six yet, uh, 16 of them were killed by an illegal poison. So just for some comment on that, please. Um, well, I, I am, unfortunately, I'm in a, a difficult position, and it always feels awkward um, when I ask these, these questions. I... You know, because obviously your natural desire is to be as helpful as possible in answering them, but for reasons of the fact there's still a live uh, criminal investigation, I, uh, I can't really comment on the, the method uh, or um, indeed the, uh, the, the kind of assumptions that the police may have drawn about what has happened in this instance, because it may well further add to the speculation um, uh, as, to, as to the cause, uh, and we have to trust the the, the police to release information as and when they feel capable of doing so. Um, they are um, obviously having ongoing reviews in terms of the case, and um, and I'm sure when they feel able to give more detail, they will do so. Um, but clearly, the, as as Dave Thompson has has indicated, um, you know, the police have already themselves indicated that a, a, a high proportion of the birds that were found have been have been poisoned. Um, and uh, as, as far as I'm, I am conscious, there's still a criminal investigation underway, so I can only um, ask the committee to reflect both those facts and uh, not perhaps read too much into uh, the press release that was issued on the 21st of October, um, uh, as has been referred to by Mr Thompson. Um, but clearly, this was a particularly difficult and upsetting incident, and... Uh, indeed, I've met uh, Andrew Goddard and those who, who raised a petition in relation to uh, their, their concern about this issue and desire to see more, more done to tackle wildlife crime. And, uh, you know, I've, I've no doubt about the strength of feeling in the Black Isle and the wider Highland community about the nature of this offence. I do welcome the fact that, that um, 
all stakeholders in the area came together in this incident to offer a reward and I commend RSPB for starting that process and others for, for augmenting it uh, and I, I still hope that um, if there is uh, uh, a possibility of a, a criminal prosecution that, that may well be helpful in, in yielding evidence of what actually happened but beyond that convener I, I can't really go I'm afraid I yeah. hope the committee can understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, just a wee follow-up, convener, please. Um, yeah, I can understand uh, what you're saying there. Um, these, these birds are fairly dear to my own heart. I was along at the Tolly feeding point uh, helping to open it just a couple of years ago, so would have helped to, to feed some of these red kites and so on. So it's really sad to see them being... Um, poisoned uh, like they have. I mean, the, the rumours can cause all sorts of difficulties for local landowners and, and others, and I've got a lot of sympathy for that. One aspect of the investigation that strikes me as, as being interesting is the time it took the police to actually, you know, get warrants to go and look for poisons. Um, a couple of weeks or more, uh, <clears throat> and they went to specific farms, which everyone will be aware of, um, which can, you know, further star uh, the rumours. Uh, are you planning, uh, well, f first of all, uh, well, are you planning to carry out uh, an investigation of any kind once, once this case is wrapped up, if you like? Uh, um, uh, are you going to be looking at just how the police operated, how the investigation was carried out. Is there going to be an investigation into that at some time in the future? Because I feel that maybe we could learn a number of lessons uh, from this, and I, I dare say you'll be getting a report from, from the police in due court, uh, course, irrespective of whether you know they, they bring this to a, um, a, a, a prosecution uh, or whatever. So that's the first point. W will you be looking at this in some detail in terms of how things were carried out. And the second point, just to follow up, is were you consulted about the press release and the wording of the press release from Police Scotland before it went out? Um, I, on the latter point, I, I believe I, we didn't have an awful lot of notice of the press release going out, so I, I certainly didn't have any input to it at all. Uh, I don't know whether colleagues and um, a shaking of head, so I don't think our, our own team had any input to that press release, uh, I'm afraid, in that instance. We are trying to work in, uh, closely with the police on all media uh, and comms relating to wildlife crimes. Uh, it can be difficult, obviously, because an offence might be discovered in a, you know, what would in the past be described as a local divisional area uh, and a local um, uh, communication might be put out to local media about that incident. And uh, you know we are trying to get, without being centralist, and uh, uh, we are trying to get a degree of kind of consistency of how these instances are are reported in partnership with the police. And I, I know they do recognise that, you know, and to to improve that uh, process. But I think in this occasion, unfortunately, it's, it's not one that we we had any input to. Um, as to the the investigation itself, I mean, obviously we don't interfere in, in operational matters, as I say. But I am aware that um, there must. You know, the, the police will have made a decision as to what kind of warrant they needed or whether they need a warrant at all. And um, I'm aware, certainly if, if the police had any, as I understand, any reason to believe that evidence was being tampered with or moved, they could have gone in without a, a warrant to uh, to investigate straight away. But um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and uh, I'll put that on the record, convener, um, and perhaps I'll leave it to the, the justice authorities to... Uh, to, to see whether or not um, that that's appropriate, but um, clearly they felt they must must have needed a warrant uh, to to go in. Uh, and, uh, and as to whether we can ask for a review of the case, certainly um, uh, it's something perhaps that uh, might be best addressed to Lord Advocate uh, as uh, and, and indeed to the Justice Secretary as to whether that's something they might want to contemplate. I don't have portfolio responsibility for policing, um, but. We have ongoing engagement with with police through Post Scotland, and clearly a, a good relationship, I believe, with them. And uh, we can ask for their their own perspective as to whether there's anything they feel, um, in retrospect, they might have done differently. Yeah. Certainly, uh, Hugh Dignan, I think, wants to comment on that. Um, so I, I should just add, uh, for the sake of clarity, um, Police Scotland did discuss with us the fact that they were going to release that press release and the broad terms of what would be in it, but the detail of it, the actual size of the release, we didn't see any of that. So that was uh, just to be clear about the exact process there. 
Okay, um, I want a couple of follow-up points on this. Uh, the uh, concerns that were raised about uh, this from people who have had their properties searched included members of the National Farmers Union of Scotland. And when I asked the police last week about who the partners were in uh, PAWS, uh, they said the NFU weren't a partner. Uh, but I noticed from studying who is that Scottish land and estates are partners. Um, I've had some constituents uh, from uh, the NFU organisation in the Highlands asking if uh, the NFU ought to be a member of PAWS uh, in order that they are part of that discussion. Um, well, a... Uh on that point, Camino, I, I certainly acknowledge that um, you know if we're going to have a, a, a broader partnership as we can and get as much concerted action, and I do welcome NFUS's strong condemnation at the time uh, of the incident in Rosshire, which I think was very helpful. Um, I understand that, that there are discussions taking place about NFUS's involvement in Post Scotland, so uh, you know we can come back to the committee once we've got more detail of what what they want to do, because um, clearly we can't force NFUS to, to be involved they don't want to but clearly it's encouraging to hear that, that colleagues in the Highland area at least are are keen to be involved and consulted on, on on measures so that's something we can take forward as part of those discussions to see if it's possible. And furthermore about pause would it not be a good idea for it to meet in Rossshire for one of its meetings rather than in some central place in uh, Livingston or wherever? Well, to be fair to, to members of PAWS, I think usually they're trying to help me by, by meeting in Edinburgh to make it easier. Um, so I'm probably the guilty party there, convener, but um, I take the point and uh, I think uh, there may be a case at some point for having a meeting um, where obviously clearly many of the fences are, are being con uh, conducted in, in rural Scotland. I think there would be perhaps an important message to, to take the PAWS Scotland out to those groupings at there some point. There are quite a few people who would... Uh, probably like to claim a meeting. This being the most <laughs> high profile event of this year, you know, prompts me to suggest that I think people would be reassured if they saw this uh, uh, meeting, uh, you know, in some other parts of the country. And uh, of course, the minister's always so, welcome yeah. to attend as well. Yeah. Uh, in our part of the uh, part of the world, I am reminded, um, uh, convener, that uh, by by Hugh Dignan that we've already uh, discussed having a meeting in the Cairngorms, uh, so that we have started the process. I think it's in the eastern Cairngorms. I think from uh, previous discussions, but we can obviously provide details to. I can see Mr. Day looking uh, very interested in that in that idea, um, but we, yeah, and it's within the national park boundary. We were conscious of. Uh, the relationship between the National Cairngorm National Park and, and wildlife crimes being committed in the National Park. So we th we're going to take a, a meeting of Paw Scotland to the National Park. So we're happy to communicate the timing of that and make sure members are aware of the opportunity. Good. Uh, it's nice to tour the country. Um, uh, I'd just like to ask you a very specific question uh, that also affects Paws. But uh, I asked the uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Allen last week about whether there was a map of where carcasses were found of red kites, given that uh, there have been long, large numbers of uh, uh, deaths in that particular area. And uh, he said that uh, a paw raptor subgroup was conducting an ongoing exercise to map the various carcasses, but that the police do not chart or map every carcass. In the case of a crime like this, where there were 16 mm. red kites uh, poisoned, uh, etc., you know, I think it would help the public to know just exactly that the police are yeah. creating that kind of map. Because, you know, in the past, as I said, there have been quite a number of deaths in a similar area, mm. and it would be very useful to see where the carcasses were found. Yeah, I think um, I, I certainly recognise. Uh, Convener, your, your point and the importance of mapping, I think, is, is recognised by Paw Scotland, and they have, as, as you've indicated, been doing good work on developing mapping. Um, the, the police clearly have records of um, of, of recorded crimes uh, involving all raptors. They hold data on incidents where they suspect foul play was involved in dead or missing raptors. And RSPB have, have published a paper on the effects of crime on red kites in Black Island, shown. Um, uh, you know the, the, the relation to the equivalent population down south, but it's also true to say that not in every case do we a find a body um, or a carcass of a raptor. We, as I say, we've, we've lost a seagull recently, uh, very tragically. 
and, and uh, to this date, at least I'm not aware, we have found any evidence, physical evidence of the death of that seagull. Uh, so it will remain a mystery as to what has happened to it. So therefore it's difficult to then map exactly what happened and where. Um, but insofar as we have definitive evidence of where birds are found, I believe the police would uh, you know, be very constructive in helping provide that information for mapping purposes. So uh, it may well be that the explanation for the point about not being able to map all, all incidents is largely because the cannot maybe a member of the public hands in a bird and then can't say where they found it or the bird has disappeared and, uh, and therefore we're unable to uh, locate it. Uh, but I would just again remind um, uh, the committee and indeed wider public of the, the Post Scotland app which actually helps with, there's a little tool on it to help actually map physically where you're taking the picture of the carcass which will obviously help the police find the carcass and we certainly encourage people not to move the evidence before that very reason because it may be uh, you know, moving it from one potentially one land holding to another uh, if people are inaccurate about where they have found the bird in the first place. Furthermore, I suppose we should emphasise that it could be poisonous to them for, for handling the bird. Absolutely, that's a very important point, Camina. Yeah. Um, right, we've got a further question in this regarding the collection of evidence from Dave Thompson. Uh, well, it was the, uh, the powers of the SSPCA in particular uh, that I was uh, keen to, to ask the Minister <coughs> about. Um, when we were discussing this with the police and the Procurator Fiscal Service last week, a number of interesting things came out of this, and uh, I was drawing a comparison between the powers of water bailiffs, you know, who are essentially appointed by by the private sector through the, the, the salmon fisheries boards and so on and um, they have extremely um, wide powers you know although the police said that they they hardly ever use them these days um, or they tend because they tend to involve the police at an early stage but nevertheless the powers are there and the water bailiffs have them powers of arrest and seizure and all sorts of other things I, I believe um, and there's also the aspect of local authorities who have power under the Animal Health Act in relation to animal disease and, and movements of animals and all sorts of things. And a number of local authorities appoint specialist animal health officers. I just wonder, um, the, the, the Wild Fisheries Review also mentions briefly the water bailiff issue and does mention the potential to integrate the bailiffing system more effectively with Police Scotland and other wildlife crime functions. Um, and I, I noted that the Procurator Fiscal Service um, uh, said that they deal with animal welfare issues as well as you know, broad, broader wildlife crime and so on. And it strikes me there's, there's just a number of different enforcement bodies and, and others involved. I just wonder if it might be useful um, for the government to have a look at consolidating some of this because, uh, you know, is it necessary that local authorities are enforcing the animal health uh, and welfare legislation um, or should that be something that could go to the specialist police unit that's already dealing with with um, wildlife crime and, 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 and so on? I mean, I just wonder if it's still necessary for 32 local authorities all to be doing their own thing and doing it at different levels. Uh, and it ties in fairly neatly, I would suspect, you know, with the whole animal welfare issue. And, of course, that brings us to the SSPCA. And, uh, sorry, I'm giving you an awful lot of questions here. And, you know, the possibility of the SSPA uh, being authorised, you know, to carry out greater functions than they currently have power to do. Yep. Well, certainly on the um, uh, the wild wild fisheries uh, review aspect of, I mean, I know they, they obviously did make a recommendation, uh, which will obviously be uh, taking on, on uh, as with other recommendations under advisement and coming back with proposal in due course. But they did recommend that um, a national central unit would be deployed to to coordinate the issuing of um, uh, warrants uh, for. Uh, the, the, the um, water bailiffs and the potential to integrate the bailiffing system more, more effectively with Police Scotland and other wildlife crime functions. So that's something, something we, we will look at and in due course come back uh, to the committee and other stakeholders on, on our views on that. Um, so I, I take note of the point that, that uh, Mr Thompson makes about consolidation and, and um, perhaps an opportunity to have a greater degree of um, uh, uh, 
know, sta standardisation and perhaps consistency of, of how these things are done. But in relation to um, the SSPCA, uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, you know, I mean, there's certainly interesting parallels. I know parallels have been made between the water bailiffs and the SSPC in this respect. And I would just note for the record that I think the point that picked up maybe earlier on in discussion with Mr Day and, and indeed the convener, that we do have, a generally speaking, a better record of prosecuting offences against salmon and um, and other poaching offences uh, relating to salmon, uh, perhaps than, than we do other aspects of wildlife crime. And it may not be unconnected to the fact that we've got more eyes and, eyes and ears on the ground, or in this case on the water, um, looking for people committing offences. One of the, the purposes behind the consultation, not only because it had been a commitment uh, given at the time of, uh, of the, the, the Wayne Act going through Parliament that we would undertake a, a consultation on extra powers for the SSPC is because we, the reasons that Claudia Beamish was indicating earlier on in terms of the need to look, use all investigative tools, we have very few eyes and ears um, on the ground and despite the best efforts of the police, it's always going to be difficult to catch criminals in the act, so therefore it's of interest to us to take soundings from people on the potential, at least, for, for SSPCA's powers to be extended. It's worth stating that um, you know, already on completion of appropriate training, SSPCA inspectors can, without a warrant, enter non-domestic premises for the purpose of taking possession of a suffering animal or destroying an animal if the inspector believes immediate entry is, a, in a, is appropriate in the interest of the animal. They can enter non-domestic premises to search for and seize any evidence, including animals, as evidence in relation to a related offence if they believe that any delay caused by seeking a warrant would frustrate the purpose of that search, which maybe goes back to the earlier point about other incidents um, that we're aware of, and enter any uh, and inspect any non-domestic premises for the purpose of ascertaining whether or not an offence under Part 2 of the 2000 Act has been committed. And with a warrant, they can enter any premises for the purpose of taking possession of a suffering animal or destroying an animal where appropriate and enter any premises to search and seize any animal or other thing as evidence in relation to a relevant offence under Part 2 of the 2006 Act. So they already have quite substantial powers in relation to animal welfare issues. The consultation is really looking at whether that should be extended to uh, instances where perhaps uh, you, you find a a trap uh, illegally laid, but no animal is yet being caught, and therefore no suffering is, is being experienced. Um, or if there's uh, other reasons to believe, you know, a wildlife crime is being committed. So uh, it's, uh, it has been quite well defined, I believe, in the in the consultation as to the potential powers that uh, that SSPC might be might be considered to have. But obviously, we're going to look through the analysis of the uh, evidence that's been submitted. We've published the responses to the consultation already, but um, I'm hoping that we'll have uh, analysis of those responses uh, to me um, uh, by the early early next year um, at the latest, and um, we'll then obviously come back to Parliament with our views on those proposals. Um, but I'm not sure if I've answered everything that, that, that Dave Thompson asked me, Convener. It's <laughs> a, a, a pretty good effort, yes, uh, uh, Convener. D just one, one wee follow-up, uh, uh, you know, the Wild Fisheries Review, obviously, in relation to the bailiffs, um, you know, uh, highlighted the need for accountability and, and the unit, as you say, and uh, you know, I think we should maybe be looking at a much more, a broader look at the whole legislative area there anyway, but one of the big issues, I think, about giving further powers to the SSPCA would be that issue of accountability. Mm. How, how do you hold them to account? Well, uh, that's a, a good point, and clearly it's an issue we'd have to take into consideration in, in considering any f any further extension of powers. But I suppose the point I was making is that the SSPC all, already have quite extensive powers in relation to animal welfare, and, and presumably are felt to be accountable for for what they do in relation to animal welfare issues. Um, so I hope that if we do decide to proceed with additional powers for the SSPC, it would not be inconceivable that um, you know that accountability can be demonstrated. Uh, and uh, obviously appropriate training would be given to, to SSPCA officers in advance of them having an extended role of this kind. Um, it's uh, in relation to the, the bailiffs, they, they, they obviously work very closely with local police, wildlife crime officers uh, in particular as part of their duties and uh, work with the local procurator fiscal. So there's already a, a good you know, example where water bailiffs are working very closely with the justice authorities. But I will have to consider in, in depth the... <coughs> Um, the concerns that have been expressed by by the police and other uh, consultees, and also those who are in favour of the proposal, and come back with a considered view as to you know what to do in relation to that consultation. Thank you. I have to move on. I think um, a supplementary, please, from Angus Macdonald. Yeah, 
Thanks, Commissioner. Just following on from, from Dave Thompson's point regarding the SSP, I mean, it, uh, as you've mentioned, Minister, it's clear that uh, Police Scotland aren't uh, convinced that uh, the SSPCA should have extra powers, um, as, uh, as, they, uh, as they mentioned in evidence last week. Um, and uh, Dave Thompson's rightly raised the issue of, uh, of checks uh, should extra powers be given uh, to ensure that uh, these powers aren't uh, or, or wouldn't be abused. Um, I would just urge you, Minister, uh, should you decide to go down that route, that uh, um, the concerns that uh, SSPCA officers could overstep the mark should be taken into account. I uh, wholeheartedly agree that you know we'd have to give confidence to people that any change, and I have not yet made my mind up yet whether we, for the record, go ahead with uh, additional powers for SSPCA. I'm waiting for the analysis report to give me um, uh, give me the basis on which to make a decision. Uh, but I absolutely agree with with uh, Mr. McDonald that if we do take forward any additional powers for SSPCA, we do have to give confidence to the widest possible population stakeholders that this will be. Um, uh, you know, a measure that's that's proportionate and it's accountable that the SSPCA are accountable for their their actions and for their staff, uh, and I'm sure they would they would be keen uh, themselves to make sure that that was uh, all above board and that they um, didn't suffer any reputational damage themselves from taking on these additional powers. So I, I would hope that uh, we can come forward with positive proposals on that if it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Cara Hilton's got a question. Um, thank you, Kamina, and good morning, good morning. Minister. Um, in the government debate on wildlife crime back in May, um, you said that if you judged it necessary, the government was committed to taking further action. And in your opening statement today, again, you said that the government is determined to eliminate wildlife crime. So I would like to ask at what point um, you will consider further measures to tackle wildlife crime, and indeed, what, if, if there are any measures that you're currently um, actively considering. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an important Important point. Obviously, we've had the announcement of a number of measures. The general licence provision, which we've de debated today, is probably the key one. But also, um, Professor Pousty's review of penalties uh, will, in due course, I think, be equally important in terms of uh, if, if Professor Pousty determines there's a, a case to be made for extending um, penalties further to make a more deterrent effect. And that's something we'd take forward, um, uh, you know, uh, with serious consideration. Um, Viewing that package in a round, I think we would need to give some time to see whether they, these measures have had an impact. Clearly, the uh, formal announcement of the general licence provision only happened on the 6th of October, although it is backdated to the 1st of January in terms of um, any offence that's committed since the 1st of January. Um, it would, in theory, be one that, that SNH could consider uh, a case for removing the general licence. So um, I, I think it's, it would be fair to take advice from from the committee clearly as to, to what the committee's view is on this, but I would hope that we would have some time to see whether those measures are, are proving to be effective and indeed any additional measures that Professor Pousty recommends. I have um, uh, reiterated today my commitment to, to Claire Baker that we will undertake a desk review of regimes elsewhere, so at least we're doing the preparatory work in the background to ensure we know what other options are available to us. Um, and I uh, just reiterate the point that uh, I have tried to be fair and honest with all stakeholders on this, that um, they need to help us make this work, uh, because otherwise we will have to maybe contemplate things which would be unfortunate for those good land managers and good estates who are who are doing the right sort of things, that they would be caught up in an extra bureaucracy associated with an additional licensing scheme. But if that is necessary uh, to crack down on those who continue to ignore the law, then we may need to go down that route. Um, but we don't have a definitive timescale as yet as to when we would do that. Okay, and just, um, Minister, you've anticipated my supplementary, so I don't need to ask. I was going to ask for an update on the review of the game bird licence and so on. Please well, the, just, just to reiterate the point that Professor Pousty has agreed to do that, and uh, hopefully that will commence as soon as possible after the uh, review of penalties is concluded early in the new year. So we'll, we'll keep the committee advised as to the timing of that, if that would be helpful. Thank you for that. And uh, Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, Karina. Good morning. Um, if I could just pick up on the very specific issue of gun licences. The point being made by many folk is that those who are dependent on a gun to do their job, and that will be many, uh, would be seriously disadvantaged if their gun licence was taken away for inappropriate activity. Um, the question has been asked before. The answer has been given. Firstly, the, the subject is reserved. Uh, and secondly, of course, that the gun licensing is largely related to safety in the context of 
um, assaults on, on, on humans, shall I say, in other words, the preservation of life, and, and the gun licensing criteria do not really have anything to do with wildlife crime. I'm wondering whether that's a subject on which the, the Minister might have anything to say and whether that's something that he feels we ought to change. Um, well, it, it's an interesting point. Uh, it's not one that I've... Um really sort of considered in any depth before. I appreciate the point that's made um, about uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of legal responsibilities and powers in relation to firearms offences. Um, clearly, uh, some of the provisions we talked about today are because it's difficult to prove uh, an individual is responsible for wildlife crime. And clearly, if, if an individual was convicted of a wildlife crime, um, uh, then that would be tied to, to an individual and perhaps it might be a matter that the, the authorities in relation to offences might be able to take into account. But I know, Kavira, with your permission, if I can invite Hugh Dignan to comment on the legal position, because I know Hugh has a lot of experience in this area, that he may be able to comment on what would be possible under current legislation. Um, well, uh, as members of the committee uh, probably know, the decisions as regards firearms licensing are a matter for the Chief Constable of Police Scotland ultimately, and we are aware that firearms licenses are removed in certain cases, uh, and we are aware also that where wildlife crimes have been committed, that firearms licenses have been removed. So that is already in play to some extent. We are interested in poor Scotland in examining further in exactly what circumstances and, and, and what is the procedure that's in, in, in place for uh, taking into account wildlife crime offences when looking at a firearms application or renewal application or whether to, to remove such a licence. And, uh, and as part of that, we have, um, uh, as part of the, the work of the poor legislation and regulation group, have written to the Chief Constable and asked him if he would explain to us how that system currently operates. I don't think we're under an illusion that we can sort of interfere in that process. It is something which is strictly and rightly a, a matter for the Chief Constable, but we are keen to know how that operates and, and, and to be reassured, I think, that it is working to the best uh, possible effect in helping deter wildlife crime. Well, for the moment, I'm encouraged that, that it's being looked at and clearly it might be an area that we'd want to come back to. I'm wondering if I could pick up on a completely different issue uh, and that relates to the reporting of crime in this report. Um, I'm wondering whether it would be possible to, to put together the statistics of uh, inchoate crimes, the ones where a trap is found but no bird has actually been damaged as a result. Of, that is, an illegal trap has been found. Or, for example, an inappropriate poison bait has been found, um, but no crime has, well, no damage has yet been done, but it feels like it's a crime because it didn't actually work. I don't think uh, I see any evidence that those are reported, and I'm wondering whether they are reportable, uh, the data even exists, uh, and if that's the case, whether they should be reported, please. Um, I believe those sort of offences should be captured here, but we can come back to clarity as to exactly how they are recorded, and uh, perhaps it ties in with the earliest point uh, that was made by the convener himself as to perhaps the clarity and we could, you know, obviously this is an evolving document and we can try and improve the clarity of maybe footnoting, etc., where appropriate to, to make clear where uh, such uh, such numbers are relevant. But I, I entirely take the point. I think it is um, it ties in with the point about the SSPCA powers as well, about, you know, where there perhaps is a site of an illegal trap but but no obvious uh, victim of that, mm -hmm. that trap and therefore it limits their ability to intervene. But hopefully they would then report that to the police if they saw that now. But... Um, it would uh, obviously in, in the intervening period that might, evidence might be removed, so you might then miss the chance for a for a prosecution. So I, I do take the point, and um, we can obviously come back to committee as to how best we can reflect that in the report. If it's not obviously clearly explicit to, to members of the committee, we need to work harder on making that explicit. Thank you. Well, just one very last. Yes. Um, I wonder if I could just pick up on the issue of vicarious liability. <coughs> um, Patrick Hughes commented from the Crown Office and Prosecution Service last week that his impression is that the provision is effective, certainly at present. Um, I was encouraged by that. Is the, does the Minister have any other view on, on how vicarious liability is, is going? Well, um, we will obviously know, hopefully, relatively soon how the first, uh, first case um, is received by, um, by the, the justice system and whether the uh, vicarious liability provision is robust uh, and, and is able to withstand um, you know, scrutiny of a, of a defence lawyer, uh, and a very good one from, from what I can gather. Um, so you know, we, we will know 
um, in, in due course, whether it's, it's robust. I do take the point that has been made um, by by Mr. Hughes that you know it certainly reported to me that it has a uh, the, re the threat of a reputational impact has resulted in many land managers or so landowners ensuring their staff are properly trained uh, to know what their legal responsibilities are. Um, but clearly, we also still see wildlife crime being committed, so therefore, it's not been entirely successful in deterring uh, some serious offences from being conducted. So I think uh, we have to perhaps wait and see if a conviction can be secured and then perhaps uh, those who are sitting on the fence on this issue might uh, might uh, finally judge that it's, it's something that they, 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 it's worthy of them noting that they are at risk of, of being prosecuted under that provision. Um, I have to hope that it's not land landowners encouraging uh, their staff or, or even being um, uh, you know, being being sort of permissive of, of their staff doing this sort of activity uh, and that they genuinely are um, taking all steps they possibly can to, to encourage their staff to behave and uh, obey the law. Um, but, you know, we, we clearly uh, need to see a successful prosecution, I think, before that really, uh, that, that threat is a real one for people. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, there's a large degree of public interest in what's happening. Uh, this uh, report for this uh, particular year is very helpful for us to focus that. We've given it a good deal of time. We think that's necessary and we look forward to, uh, you know, learning uh, in the next report just exactly how much progress is being made, both to solve these crimes, but also to report them in a fashion that the public can understand easily. And we thank you very much for the detailed answers that you and your uh, of officials have given us just now. Well, so th thank you for th that. Thank you, Convener. i just add my own thanks to the committee for their clear interest in this issue. It's very helpful to me uh, also to have your own thoughts on how we should proceed. There will be a letter in the post. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have five minutes, I think, of a break to turn over. V very briefly, uh, recess just now. Um, we must uh, be quick because we've got a large session to follow. So thank you.
Well, we'll move on to uh, the next formal item, which is Agenda Item 3, the Scottish Government's Draft Budget for 2015-16. This third item today is for the Committee to take evidence on the Scottish Government's Draft Budget uh, on the theme of forestry. Uh, the Committee will hold further evidence sessions on the Draft Budget with stakeholders on the theme of SRDP and then from the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary, respectively. And we welcome today the, our witnesses, Jamie Farker from uh, the, the Scottish uh, National Manager for CONFOR. Good um, morning. Willie McGee, uh, Founder Member and Management Committee Member of the Forest Policy Group. Good morning. <coughs> Joe O'Hara, Deputy Director, Forestry Commission Scotland, Scottish Government. Hello, um, Nigel Miller, President of the National Farmers Union of Scotland. Hello, and Thanks. Jim Colchester, the Head of Forestry at Buccleuch Estates. Um, welcome to you all. Um, we had a long session on uh, wildlife crime, which um, is obviously a matter somewhat related to what the Forestry Commission has to deal with, I'm sure. But uh, we generally want to deal with the budget now. And uh, I just want to kick off with a question to ask you uh, generally, and we don't in future all have to answer every question, um, or we might have to suspend the rules of the Parliament. Um, but, you know, what do the witnesses think about the overall level of Forestry Commission funding in this draft budget? And I presume we should ask people other than the Forestry Commission first, but... Um, uh, fire away. Put, just indicate if you want to speak and I'll call you. Right, Willie McGee. Um, <coughs> the, the, the level um, of, uh, of budget we feel um, is, um, whilst it will do the job for 2015-16, um, the Forest Policy Group believes that it should be set higher. Um, I put a figure for the grants alone in my written submission of 45 million. I would like to see it higher than that, possibly 60 million. Um, but I think the forestry, um, in terms of its weighting in rural development and contribution to the, the rural sector, um, deserves more money. Um, and just for the record, I'd like to see it m more fully integrated um, with agriculture in terms of the way that it's, that it's handled. Anybody else want to? Uh, Nigel Miller. Yeah, um, yeah, probably I should make some comment. I think that uh, you know, having read your other submissions, uh, you know, I can see exactly where Willie's coming from, and I think that you know, all sectors would like to see more money. And I think there are certainly strands of expenditure there, which you know, look uh, as if they're quite difficult. You know, uh, um, but I think you know, given the, the overall package that we're looking at, and, and some pretty significant cuts in other other areas. You know, to get big increases at this stage can only be at the expense of other sectors and is therefore very difficult. Uh, and uh, I guess in many ways we're in that ghastly world where it's a matter of prioritising and, and, uh, uh, and it's a bit of a compromise. Thanks. Indeed, thank you. Uh, Jamie? The Scottish Government is... Um, I, I, I think is supporting our, our, our sector extremely well as overall. If you look at a budget of 60, 65 million pounds, um, it's a very successful sector and delivers to virtually every agenda that government sets us. Um, but there is some fairly radical disparity within the way in which that 65 million is, is dispersed. Um, we have um, said that um, and, and continue to argue for the um, authority of Forestry Commission to be uh, maintained and for it to retain its autonomy as, as the forest authority. And um, so we've always um, supported the money that they require to retain their expertise to be able to deal with a very complicated uh, and tactical um, industry. But the, where the, the budget fails is the expectation on the private sector to deliver virtually all the 
new planting targets. And I echo Willie's comments there that um, straightforward math shows that um, the 36 million pounds wouldn't be uh, sufficient for that, or indeed 30 million. And at the end of the day, of the 36 million going to the private sector, in fact, Scottish Government is only putting up 16 million because the rest comes through in EU um, co funding. And um, I'm Jam, you've heard me say in, in this company before that I think that's a pretty pathetic sum of money um, to commit to the successful sector we have. Uh, I'm the convener, of course, not the chairman, but uh, we are happy to accept the terms that you state at the moment. I should ask uh, Joe, uh, to Joe O'Hara to perhaps respond a little, but with a supplementary have you spent all your money from last year before we're thinking about using the money for this year? When you say spent all of our money for last year, just to be clear, do you mean the year that we're in? Well, the year that we're in. 12, 13? Or the year that before that, was the money spent in the budget allocation in total? Yes, it was. Um, we have our allocation for... The grants, we also have the allocation for our work as a department, and we also have the allocation for um, the National Forest Estate. So we have these three very different headers, if you like, within our budget, and sometimes we move <coughs> between the headers depending on what plays out during the year. But we did spend it. I think to come back to the question of grants, um, I do take, take Jamie's point, and we've We've been discussing this very actively with the sector through our customer reps group. Um, bearing in mind that this is a one-year budget, so far we haven't rejected new planting proposals because there hasn't been enough money. We've been able to meet demand with the money, but those proposals haven't met the 10,000 target. Okay, and we're particularly concerned about increasing the amount of productive woodland in that. That is a challenge for us. However, we feel that, that on balance, what we're doing for the year ahead, what we've put in for the year ahead, and what we know is coming through in the pipeline from discussions with the sector and through some of the initial conversations that we've had, that the figure that we've got into the budget of next year should meet the demand for new planting. But there's no question that if suddenly that demand did increase, the amount of money in the budget at some point could, could hit the buffers. But we think for next year, knowing where we're at, that this is a, this is a fair allocation. Did you want to come back, Jimmy? So, so the, 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 the uh, thank you. Yes, um, the microphone is handled centrally. Sorry, we know when to cut you off, <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> uh, yes, we spent all our money um, uh, in 2014, and indeed, we're lucky to um, get some extra euros out of the. 2007 to 13 program that had been uh, unallocated at the end of the program. So in fact, I think um, we actually spent about four, 41 million in. Uh, yes, it was. 40, uh, sorry, I've got it here, but yeah, it was 41. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and the the unfortunate side of, of of our business is the time and the investment that has to be made in bringing forward um, new planting schemes. It is taking on average 18 to 24 months to bring those schemes through scoping and consultation. And uh, that's just a fact of life nowadays. And uh, we, we complain about it, the time it takes every now and then. But in, in practice, we understand that's, that's the reality. But if you go back 18 months or two years, the message was quite clear. 2014 will be a transition year, and so uh, we don't know when the grants will be open again. I'm sorry, um, we won't be able to award contracts. Well, the sensible agent on behalf of his client simply sits back and gets on with other business. And this is an unfortunate um, cycle we have to follow because of the Royal Development Seven Year Programme. And it does produce these peaks and troughs, and we are short 
on the number of schemes that are likely to come through in 2016 as a result. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Jim Court, just to... I'd just like to echo Jamie's point. Um, we have, being active in this role, we have schemes which we have, we took a risk, we took, looked at the risk of not getting a contract at the right time because you have to purchase your trees well in advance because they have to be grown for when you're going to need them. The complications of the SRDP1, the scheme was not really fit for what it was trying to deliver. The new scheme will be better. I mean, the Forestry Commission have taken a lot of what we recommended on board. This new scheme will be de designed to be fit for purpose, but that meant that there was a considerable risk for people who are trying to undertake this, and so it was decided on many cases to delay this. So there is actually quite a lot of latent demand out there to do new planting. And with the changes in the subsidies that you are talking about, the land that is probably more ideally suited to productive forestry will start to become more economically viable to go into forestry as we move towards 2016, 17, 18, 19. So there is a chance that the, the productive element won't be front-end loaded in the next SRDP. It will come towards the end because it actually, and that's probably better for all parties because we can go into this and design it properly. But it is a fact that, uh, as Nigel Miller has said, you know, we've got tight budgets and, uh, you know, these are imposed upon us and uh, indeed we hope that the Minister is providing as good an opportunity as possible for you. Um, uh, we've got several people who want to ask questions about that. Perhaps, Willie, you could incorporate what you were just going to say once you hear what these are. So, first of all, we've got Graham. Okay. I, I Graham Day, you, I, then I, I note the comments from both Jamie Farker and William McGee indicating there's a need for an enhanced budget. But can I ask whether they've got ideas from where else, from where in the overall rural pot this money could and should be derived? Or are, are they simply saying, as I'm sure Nigel Miller would say on behalf of his organisation, that they, they can justify asking for more? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, convener. It does tie in with what I was going to... Um, to uh, respond to Nigel on. I, I, um, wh when I'm talking about forestry um, uh, and woodlands and trees, um, m perhaps I need to be a little bit more explicit because what Jim and, and Jamie and to a lesser extent Joe are talking about is blanket afforestation. That's taking a piece of land and covering it with trees. Um, but we know through work that we've done with farmers in the south of Scotland, and um, one of those is sitting two places down from you, um, where we had a, a, a pioneering scheme to put trees into the Scottish landscape um, at a low density, parkland trees, um, where the farmer um, directly benefits, to, receives the funding. So um, coming to Nigel's point about the reallocation, what I would be making a plea for is not to take money away necessarily from farmers. It's to it's to move it around, and to target farmers and say you 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 know you're not being asked to sell land to give up huge chunks of land here. What you're being asked to do is to create upland parkland where trees are in the landscape. It's not the commercial forestry that Jim and Jamie are talking about, but it's a different way of looking at the at the whole issue of forestry and woodlands and how they integrate with agriculture in Scotland. Okay. Uh, you want to follow that up, Jim Hume, uh, having um, declared an interest? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I should say I was a trustee of Borders Forest Trust, uh, along with Willie McGee, many, many moons ago, and um, obviously uh, was involved in some of the innovation that carried on. Um, so yeah, following up on Willie's very, very point, uh, and it's part of the question I was just, to, just about to uh, ask, uh, and that is on integration, and rather than having the the old farming v forestry uh, sort of argument um, and I think it would be interesting to hear about some innovative ideas we could do about seeing um, forestry as a, a crop rather than a, a competitor to, to, to farming land and also of course with the va a vast area of Scotland being tenanted where that crop could be seen as a, a tenant's improvement rather than something only landlords do and therefore it, it, it's going to take away good sheep grazing land, uh, uh, etc. So I just wondered on people's views on, on, on that. No, well, maybe you could tell us. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Get it on the record. <laughs> Sorry? 
on no, the record we had, they will. Oh, oh, but the, the um, yes, <laughs> I, I think that the, the, there's not enough um, effort made to um, to work with between um, foresters and upland, specifically hill farmers. Um, first of all, to do as Jim says, to put trees into landscape. What, what we did was we we had a, a, a subsidised scheme where farmers. Um, received the money, materials and assistance to put these trees into landscape so that it improved um, upland pastures um, and Jim's point about working with tenants where new areas of woodland or existing areas of woodland if, if, uh, and I'm talking about benefiting farmers here farmers if they have more diversity of income um, through working in shelter belts or new areas of woodland mm -hmm. um, would be able to add to their income in a way that, that made them more resilient mm -hmm. to changes in things like livestock prices or, or agricultural subsidies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's my top of worth. And Nigel Miller? Yeah, uh, I can only be supportive of that. I think that uh, the reality is there's been you know, a, a conflict between agriculture and forestry, uh, I guess, over the last few years, and I've been guilty of being involved in that. I think very much because of... We just don't have enough land, basically, and those 10,000 hectares seem to threaten the critical mass of Scottish agriculture. Uh, so you, you, you've got that tension there, but I think we've got to be smart and look at uh, uh, ways of doing it which allow us to actually work together. And I think you know, that, that's a good example. But I think in the present uh, moment, you know, there are some you know, outstanding priorities here. And I think my understanding, the real driver for forestry is, is uh, climate change targets, but also maintaining the critical mass of commercial forestry to maintain those jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe we've got to, you know, look at uh, restocking and, uh, you know, commercial forestry in a more imaginative way so we get, you know, more biodiversity benefits out of it. Because the reality is that, you know, Unless we do get that planting rate up, there's going to be more and more pressure on, on, on our very limited land mass. So if we can get multifunctional solutions, you know, what uh, uh, Willie's talking about on, on upland farms where you can maybe get open woodland with grazing in it, but also look at commercial forestry so that it's actually in the fringes or in glades producing the biodiversity benefits that everybody wants. You know, maybe we've got what a solution to try and juggle a very tight land mass into... The, the benefits that we, we, we all need and um, within those budgets. And I think that, you know, one of the points I think Confor made was that, you know, there was a limited budget for that restocking and, and a more imaginative uh, restructuring of our plantings. Uh, you know, to me, that maybe is one of the priorities. Can we do that better to get multiple benefits? Uh, and, uh, you know, I think also a basic one for me is, is you know, plant health and research. Very flat budget there. The reality is we seem to be facing, uh, you know, a minor... Uh, 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 crisis as far as you know, tree diseases go, and that's maybe climate change driven. But the reality is, unless we crack that, you know, the whole sector you know is under threat. And therefore, at this point, it would make sense to try and prioritise spending to try and push those threats back. I think these are obviously the kind of things we will be taking up with the minister in due course. But we'll also be following up issues about the acquisition and disposal policy of the uh, Forestry Commission slightly later in this session as well. Um, thank you for that. Did you have any follow-up on your question, Jim? I'll go back to the core part of the question, yeah. which uh, that was going to be my supplementary, so I'll do it backwards. But uh, obviously, there, there, are, there is uh, targets of 10,000 hectares per year. I don't think in Scotland we've reached them since for about 12 years. And, and if we go back about uh, 30, 30 or 40 years, uh, we're only doing about a fifth or a fifth of the planting that used to happen in, in, in those days in the 70s. So, and obviously we have uh, climate change mitigation targets as well, which seem to be getting missed too. So with these two issues, I was wondering what implications uh, some of the, the panel thought uh, regarding missing the planting targets uh, is having on our uh, mitigation targets regarding climate change. Who wants to answer? Nobody. No, it's fine. Good. We can move Have on. A clue. <laughs> Jimmy Parker. Um, I, I, can I just quickly go 
back to, to I think I'm going to offer Nigel Miller a job in Confor because um, well, we'll I, be looking I, for I applaud a lot of the statements. This is becoming far too insistent. However, however N Nigel's guilty of having a short memory of, 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 of the delightful <laughs> WIAG process that, uh, that, that, that has gone on over, over the last several years. Um, we would... Uh, firstly, Forestry Commission is doing an, an exceptionally good job at the moment in raising awareness within the farming fraternity by virtue of a series of workshops and seminars on wood fuel, which is a, a, a sort of a, a real given of um, uh, really making uh, farmers and, and other landowners aware of the asset they now sit on. So there is that integration going on at the moment, and, 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 and we fully support it. But when it comes down to meeting climate change targets, um, there is no better way um, than, no disrespect to Willie's um, wishes for um, parkland-type um, landscape, Scotland's very lucky and has a lot of it, particularly in some of the, the finest managed lands in South West Scotland, for instance, on Drumlandrig and that sort of place. And that is, that's been integrated land use for a very long time. But if you want to meet your target, your carbon targets, you need to plant productive conifers in this part of the world, and that will be the quickest way of... Um, of, of, of meeting those. And that is where the headline figure of our planting targets is so wrong. As Joe said, we, we have a real problem in failing to, um, to, to meet the productive conifer element of the target. We're some 9,000 hectares behind already in the last two years. Graham Day is a supplementary. Uh, just to go back to my original point, if I may, Mr. Farker. Um, have you identified where the additional sums of money you're looking for might come from, or are you, do you simply feel justified in saying, we need more? Um, yes, I'm afraid I don't have the information beside me. I'm, I'm happy to send it back, but I did present this in the spring when we were uh, talking about CAP and SRDP. Uh, CONFOR did, in fact, make a uh, highlight um, from memory somewhere in the region of 40 million pounds, which is going to several different program street funding streams within SRDP, where uh, in our submission, those could have been either given lower priorities, lower allocations, or indeed they could have been funded from other streams out with SRDP. Okay. Okay. Jim Hume. Title thanks, Convener. And just to finish on the part, the body of the, the question regarding climate change mitigation and planting targets, and obviously wanting uh, some witnesses wanting more trees planted, ov obviously. Uh, but there is another conflict, not just the, the, the farming versus forestry uh, history that we have, but it's also um, peat-based soils versus mineral-based soils, and uh, the views that you're know, planting in peat-based soils, which are, there are many of in Scotland actually releases a lot of carbon into the air and therefore it takes perhaps more than the life of the tree to sequestrate that. I don't know if anybody has any views or facts on that to add or subtract. The, the, the great fortune of being involved in the trees and carbon business um, for the last 15 years, I think um, two things. One, um, not meeting the targets. Uh, I mean, I've just done a, a kind of a back of the envelope um, calculation, which uh, please um, do not take as gospel, but if you miss targets by 5,000 hectares per annum and you use uh, a, a very conservative average of something like 50 tonnes of CO2 per hectare, um, then you're about quarter of a million tonnes mm -hmm. per annum down. Um, I mean, I, as I say, that, that's, not a, that's a guess just because that, that's taking an average of over the life of a forest. Um, the question of peaty soils um, on shallow peats, I mean, Jo will say her, her own thing about um, Forestry Commission guidance on planting on, on peats and deep peats, um, which should not happen. Um, on shallow peats, like peaty glaze, the 
PD Glaze of the Borders, um, you're, you, you will get an initial release of carbon dioxide from the soils. Um, and that will take you through to 10 years once you get canopy closure in the in the forest. Thereafter, um, um, work that Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and Edinburgh University and others have done have shown, you know, quite convincingly that uh, forest will then become a positive contributor. Um, okay. uh, so that, that that question, Jim, would apply on deep peats, and I'm not going to go there. No. Okay. Can I just make the point at the moment? Just to clarify this for all of us, um, what is the equation? If trees are longer in the ground, because, as you say, in this case, after 10 years, you know, on shallow peat, they're actually going to be becoming a sink. If you're planting parkland trees or shelter belts or, uh, you know, farms are involved in this, they're looking for a crop. But in fact, broadleaves and native woodlands are actually in the ground a lot longer. So aren't they actually sequestering more than the 40-year cycle or whatever it is for uh, commercial forests? Yeah. He's shaking his head. The answer is, <laughs> the answer is, is yes and no. And you, you could, no, no, the, I, I will explain very, very quickly. The, um, a, a native woodland um, in poor upland soils will take a lot longer to sequester the, the CO2 from the atmosphere than a, a fast-growing Sitka spruce block. However, you're correct. You then remove the Sitka spruce block after 40 years and you will have emissions, not only because you've removed the timber, but you've disturbed the soils. Um, so you would be able to say that a, a long-established, slow-growing native woodland is a, a steadier um, sink of um, uh, uptake in greenhouse gas um, whereas with a, a conifer crop you may have a failure to restock or patchy restocking or something happens which means that it's less efficient over the long term. We'll look forward to some references to that perhaps for our benefit as well Mr Colchester. Um, Willie is correct it is an extremely complicated picture but uh, the reality is with construction timber and productive forestry, you are taking material off-site into something which has a long life, a stored carbon. It's the whole purpose of timber frame building. So actually, if you add up subsequent rotations, you can actually get to a higher carbon sequestration than you can with a native woodland, because a native woodland is not generally being harvested at the moment. I think that's something we should probably look at over the long term anyway but you will come to a point of equilibrium where the trees will start to die and regenerate and you don't actually increase the level of stored carbon and the wood on that site much more at all. There is some benefit to the improvement in the carbon in the soil, but there is very little gain after a certain point. You know, the, light, the graph goes flat, whereas with productive conifer, it will go up, down, but it is gradually climbing all the time. We could talk about the science quite a yeah. bit, but you talk about timber for construction um, how much of the output of uh, commercial forestry is actually for construction and how much is for uh, paper making and fence posts and the like which don't have a long life the uh, in a, an average Sitka spruce crop that's grown to 40 odd years we would be looking in the region of 50% of that into a log of which probably we could say 40 to 50 percent of that will go into stored volume so probably about 30 percent of the carbon that is on that crop will end up in long-term storage well just a very quick point here um, and this is where it gets to the science we know from looking at forests in other parts of the world temperate forests um, that have been around longer than our temperate forests we have very 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 few that we can look at that the graph is not flat that what happens is that the, the forest starts putting more, Jim alluded to it there, carbon into the soil, and you get very, very high quantities of stored carbon in the northwest of the states, in the northeast of the states, and in European forests. We just don't have them around long enough to have the, the data on that. Joe, did you want to, or Nigel wanted to? No, Bill and Joe. Ladies first. <laughs> I think that was a, a really helpful discussion around the, the trees and peat. It is complicated. I wish there was a magic formula that um, we could bring to the committee and say, you know, X plus Y equals Z. It does depend on 
where it is and what you do with it. We do have guidance, as um, was referred to, so we don't plant on deep peat now because the science doesn't stack sure. up in terms of the carbon. So I just wanted to make sure the committee was clear on that. The other point I'd like to make, because I didn't get a chance to come in, um, I'm referring back to the budget. A lot of the discussions seem to be just around the SRDP part of the budget. I'd just um, like to uh, remind the committee of the work that's going on in the National Forest Estate in terms of integrated land use. And a third of the National Forest Estate isn't actually forest, it is open. And we are introducing starter farms exactly to try and start to, say, to tackle this issue, that it's not farming versus forestry, it's all land use at the end of the day. And as Nigel says, we have a constrained area of land and it is our responsibility as Forestry Commission to try and get the best public benefit from that land that we can, be it carbon, be it um, feedstock for industry, be it benefits for urban populations as well. And I think a lot of the discussion has been around the grants that we pay to the private sector, but obviously the rest of the budget is also funding that on the public forest estate and through things like research and advice um, that we fund as well. Nigel. Yeah, um, yeah, it has been you know, fascinating to see uh, uh, you know, the conflicts in the forestry sector. It's good to see um, well, as far as carbon sequestration goes. Uh, it, it's an extraordinarily complex subject. Uh, I, I guess from our point of view, these targets were actually developed when we didn't really, un or we maybe still don't totally understand you know, carbon sequestration. And I think since then, there's you know, a lot of evidence which shows that you know, permanent pasture systems are actually pretty good as well, even on, on you know, mineral soils rather than just peat ones. And you know, it may be you know, in the next, you know, uh, 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 I suppose, period of, 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 of development, we should actually be revisiting the scientific evidence and looking at our land mass in, 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 in a fresh light to see whether, you know, how we should manage it for, for the, you know, the best outcomes. And certainly there may well be uh, you know, prescriptions for, for grazing management which actually improve its performance. And I think uh, you know, we, we, we need to, to you know, up our game on, on uh, carbon management, not just in forestry but on, in farming as well. And I think we can do that. Well, we know that we're in a climate crisis and that uh, you know, it's very difficult to take these things over too long a term. We're going to have to stick with the targets at the moment. Uh, the minister yesterday was answering about the gas emission targets, you know, and we recognise that they are becoming tougher measures every year. So we, we all are in the, the view that we have to, to have as good information about this as possible. So I think this discussion was worth having and uh, Nigel's points are correct. Uh, uh, we'll get more chance to actually answer some of the detail as we go through. Uh, Graham Day, next. Uh, thank you, Kavir. I think we've really strayed into this already, but just to get a feel for your general views on whether the government has got the balance right between funding for forestry and funding for agriculture, taking Bowie McGee's point on board from earlier. So the, the balance, can we have a short answer on this, or is there a, a thesis? We're perfectly happy with the balance, and I think you know, the reality is there's been pretty significant cuts. There's no real business development programme at all in the agriculture, except for new entrants and in uh, your priority catchments. So you have a big change there, uh, and, and you know, you know, uh, you know, falls in other spending or cuts in other spending. So you know, the, the, every sector has felt pain, uh, and, and uh, you know, maybe that's right given the, the uh, spending round we're in. Uh, it's a tough spending round, that's the reality, and I think you know, the balance, you know, you know, the forestry sector at least have got a flat budget rather than a cut one. Yeah. Jamie? I don't disagree with Nigel. Um, Good. I, I, I think you know, <laughs> um, the, the balance is, is an inevitable one at the moment. Um, one of the barriers to um, new planting has been, uh, not trying to be positive, but a farming mentality that says, I don't want to go there, and in any case, I'm getting good money to go on doing exactly what I am doing. It's the way in which the support is delivered to farmers is therefore critical. And we have just had clarity, and we're very grateful for that, that... Um, in this program, if a, if a farmer decides to plant, he will retain his eligibility to have direct payments. And that is vitally important, so that he's got this, this choice now of how he may and could, I hope, and they will, 
start to wake up and realise there's a real opportunity on a lot of upland farms to contract their stock onto a slightly smaller area and plant trees, which will be a very profitable thing for them in the future. Alec Ferguson, you want to follow on? And uh, uh, thank you. That, that leads me very neatly into, yep. into the area of questioning I wanted to, to just explore briefly. And I absolutely understand what Joe O'Hara was saying about the, the, the National Forest Estate and the um, whole range of land use options that it, that it has to look at and manage and encourage. Um, but the fact is, at the end of the day, the, um, it is up, essentially it's up to the private sector to um, invest in and, and manage the commercial forestry expansion that um, has been targeted under the Scottish forestry strategy. Um, and, and the main mechanism of supporting that is through the Woodland Grant Scheme. Now, consistently, ever since this parliament began, and I'm sure before, CONFOR have been adamant that the amount of funding going into Woodland Grant Scheme is not going to deliver the target set by the forestry strategy. And I, 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 is there anybody who disagrees with that statement? Okay, nobody Excellent. disagrees. Um, so we, we, we have £36 million in the draft budget for woodland grants. And for reasons that were, were, were uh, broached earlier on relating to SRDP1, it would seem that the, the, the proposed planting for next year, of 2015, is around about a third... Of, of the target. Well, I think we're looking at about 3,000 hectares, um, which now that to me suggests there's going to be a bit of an underspend in the, in the budget for next year. Is, is that correct? Joe, yes, please. Um, yeah, we, in terms of the stuff that we formally know about versus the stuff that we informally know about, so the, the figure that Confor put in their submission about the, uh, the 3,000 hectares in the pipeline, that's the stuff that we formally know about. However, because we're in this odd transition year, and the, scheme, the new scheme hasn't opened yet, but it will open in 2015-16, in, in is we're anticipating getting more in um, when we open the new scheme. So the 3,000 is the stuff that we formally know about, but we are aware there are other schemes coming through as well, so we would ex anticipate it being higher than that next year. But, but, but given the sort of 12 to 18 month period of preparation for uh, the a lot of these, A lot of that initial preparation has been done because our conservators have been working with agents to get the schemes to a point where it's, it's easier for them to put Is it possible in. to speculate what you think next year's likely Excuse me, new, just, new just let me have a look at my notes, if you just give me a minute, um, in terms of whether we've got that at the moment. We're aware... Uh, the, the team is saying that we, we, it's in the region of about 2,000 hectares. More than you already know yes. about, so we're yeah. looking at possibly five thousand. Yes, hectares. but obviously individual owners may may, may take different decisions about when exactly they put those in. I think this is the, the challenge of dealing with. We're here today to talk about a one-year budget. Yeah. We've got a seven-year um, SRDP. We've got spending review next year. <laughs> Forestry is a long-term business, so you know where we are in that cycle and the the way we need to manoeuvre between years to respond to demand. Um, makes this quite a, um, a dynamic budget to work with. That's where we are at the moment, and we think that the 30 million is a reasonable anticipation of what we will need to meet demand for next year. The 36 million, sorry. But even, even if, if, sorry, thank you for that. But even even if you even if you double the likely, <coughs> you say you've got 3,000 hectares, you know about. Even if we go up to 6,000 hectares, that's planned. That still tends to suggest there's likely to be an underspend in the budget. Is that right? I think it depends on what, what type of planting they are because the planting rates are different. I mean, all of our modelling suggests that we're about right, but to be honest, we do have to respond in year as, as well. That, this is our best guess as we stand at the moment yeah, with yeah. a scheme that hasn't opened yet, with schemes that we don't know the exact detail of going through. So this is, this is our best guess as we stand at the moment. Uh, and and ju just, sorry, before I see a lot of other people wanted to come in, but just, just to try to finalise this section of, the, yeah. of, the, of the, this discussion, it, um, Mr. Colchester spoke earlier on about um, this whole programme of planting over the next seven years being sort of backloaded. Um, do, you, do you still have confidence that the targets under the Scottish Forestry Strategy are likely to be met over the, over the SRDP period? I know we're only looking at a one-year budget. I think it's really challenging. Right, that's that's fine. So I know there are others. I've got a supplementary, but... Uh, Willie McGee on that point, then. At that point, and relating to the point that Graham asked about, um, I uh, make no bones that I think there is an imbalance between the forestry and agriculture budget. My big caveat on that would be, um, as I stated at the beginning, 
um, I would I, I I don't have a, a pat answer about where the money would come from, but my target would be arable farmers. My natural constituents are in, in the uplands and our hill farmers. And I think that uh, the whole conversation about planting, planting targets would be a, a, a more smooth and, um, a, a, and confident one where there are more incentives for hill farmers to to be recipients of funding that came from the SRDP arable pot um, and went into um, a, a greater incentive to get them to put trees in the ground. I think it's possible. Um, the, the, the rates for the, the what used to be the, the, the farm woodland um, premium, if they were upped, farmers would look much more um, uh, kindly on planting more trees. You had a supplementary uh, yeah, uh, well, it's a further, the further question, if I may, convener. But the, Dave Thompson wants to come in as well. well on, if, was if, it on this if, point? If he wants to come in on this point, then I can or, go on to uh, the next one. Well, it's really just to get a view from the panel. Um, well, he was talking there about um, hill farmers and upland and so on. Uh, my constituency, Skylark Harbour and Badenoch, with lots of crofters and so on, just to get a view from the panel on... Um, what's happening to help to encourage forest crofts and, and to get crofters, etc., you know, in, into this mix rather than just uh, farmers in, in more prosperous areas, you know, uh, in, in Scotland. I mean, there is, there is crofting forest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. um, I mean, there's, there's, there's two sides to this. There's woodland crofts and croft forestry, and we're supporting both and working with crofters' organisations on both of those at the moment. So definitely an area... This is so multifaceted, and the issues in different parts of the country throw up different, different issues and what one sector wants, um, one sector of the farming community... Um, suits their needs in one area might be different in another where, area, but we are working with, with crofters groups um, on both of those aspects at mm -hmm. the moment. Is, is there any, um, in terms of what, what crofters would be able to grow, given the, the good land in, in crofting areas is probably quite often equivalent to your upland land uh, <coughs> further, further south and the poorer land up in the hills, and of course there's a lot more deep peat and stuff as well. What's the sort of general guidance, or maybe there isn't any, in terms of what crofters should actually be planting? Is, is it the likes of conifers, or is it, uh, and, which I'm not sure they are suitable for, say, wood burning stoves, or as suitable as, uh, as other woods? I mean, what's going on in terms of directing them towards the most profitable type of um, uh, forestry, you know, in these very difficult areas? Yeah, Chris Marsh produced a crofting forestry handbook um, a number of years ago now, and to be to be honest, um, you say the most profitable. It's really what will grow, um, and what will grow uh, tends to be um, stuff like downy birch, um, uh, willows. You, you, not, it's not it's not profitable, but it would be um, quite feasible to uh, to run a firewood business off some of the stuff that you grew on your croft, and it would be on the in by ground. The out by ground very often is is not that suitable for anything other than scrub. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah well, th th thanks for that. And I see Nigel wants to come in as well. Sorry, uh, I just Miller. want to make sure that there's plenty of encouragement and cash going to come to the crofting areas as well as the other areas. You know, I think this is kind of obviously straying off budgets a, a little bit, having you know, been with members on Sky who've gone through this process and some have had you know, significant benefit. But other members of crofting townships have found it quite problematic in that you know, parts of the common grazing have been uh, allocated to regeneration. And uh, what's regenerated is exactly that, a bit of willow and a bit of uh, birch in patches. And that's it. Yet you know, the planted grants mean that they can't actually go back in there and graze around the trees even after 10 or 15 years. And that, that's a real issue for maintaining croft viability. And I think if we're going to go down this sort of crofting route, you know, we've got to have the flexibility to actually maybe recreate the environment. But actually, once you've done that, open it back up again to multiple land use uh, and, and uh, you know, 
displacement of deer also been a huge issue in Sky with uh, uh, you know, with planting regeneration, real problems for crofters. So you know this is something that's got to you know, have balance about it. And I think you know the we ag process hopefully means that planting uh, programs in the future will be smarter. But if we look at areas like uh, Lair, where the crofting communities you will know, really be under a lot of pressure, and we've seen a lot of. Uh, I suppose loss of activity, certainly in my lifetime, out of that area in the last sort of uh, 20 years, 20,000 ewes have come out of there. So no wonder the layer sales isn't as big as it was. Now you're getting to the stage that there's a, a critical mass issue there. Now there's land there that could go into forestry, but if a lot goes into forestry, that crofting community will die. You know, and, and is actually these weren't uh, poor sheep. These are North Country cheviots, which actually were worth quite a lot of money going through Laird. So you, know, this WEAG process has got to pr protect these communities and make sure that the the good land around Laird and some of the good hill land you know, goes back to sheep. Uh, and by all means, look at your know, strategic planting there. But uh, you, know, but it's, 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 the WEAG process is absolutely vital if that community is going to survive. Thank you, uh, Jim Goldchester. Um, Technical issues on Crofton up in the northwest may be different to some of the low ground in the, or the, the southern uplands, but the fundamentals of how the revenue comes in in these particular pots are the same, and it's the, partly the problem of the fact that you get paid to farm or you get paid to forest. It's the actual fact that what we should be doing is being paid to be paid to run that business in a rural environment. It's a rural business. It may involve a bit of forestry, it may involve a bit of what firewood, it may involve sheep, it may involve cereals, but it's a rural business. And the more integrated they become, the better we will start to deliver the true, all the rest of the items in the forest strategy. Okay, we've got Jim Hume. Thank, thanks very much uh, for your enthusiasm, convener. J just on that very... Questions. I know, I know, I realise that, and I appreciate More it. specific it's ones. Just a very specific one to, uh, to Buclou Estates, who uh, are neighbours of herself uh, down in the borders. In, with that, in respect of what we've been talking about integrating before, would Buclou Estates look favourably upon their tenants planting trees as their own crop, and thereafter, um, when that tenant maybe has to leave for to go into better places or, or for whatever, or retiring, um, look to um, reimburse those as uh, as like a tenants improvements. Is that something that Buclou would consider or approve? The problem isn't in the principle. The problem is in the mechanisms at the moment that are in place to actually able, enable you to do that. Um, as a forester, I have no problem whatsoever with that particular thought of the tenant actually planting ground that we want. But it must be an agreement process. You know, it, if the tenant forestry is once it's turned out, once land is turned over to forestry under the current legislation, it's in forestry forever. So, if the fo if the tenant is going to be leaving at some point in the future, the farm the landowner is left with having forestry there. So there has to be an agreement process. But I personally would not have a problem with entering into a dialogue so that actually fitted all parties. Many many of the plantings in the southern uplands are on a shelter belt basis. They are there for the benefit of the farm. So if the tenant is getting a more benefit out of strategic planting with some of that, that's got to be of the benefit for everyone. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, providing we can find the mechanism to work properly. Okay. Work to be done, perhaps. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, Alec Ferguson, of us at the next part to his just question. To, just to continue the... Please do, yes. Enlightening discussion. Thank you very much, convener. Um, 36 million has been allocated to um, w woodland grants. I understand that 30 million has, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has decided that 30 million of that should go to new planting specifically, uh, leaving some 6 million over, which uh, many would argue is not enough to cover everything that it's been asked to do. Um, given the, the, the discussion that we've just had on the importance of, of integrating forestry and farming and agroforestry agro schemes, can, can I ask how um, it is justified that um, particularly the establishment of agroforestry systems uh, is not going to be open to grant to, to, to financial support over the period of the budget we're looking at, that forestry infrastructure will be uh, equally excluded, and that the tr a tree health grant, which in this day and age, tree health is surely top of the list. Um, I, and I just wonder whether Joe in particular could address that particular situation. Of course. Um 
we, we checked it that check this um the the forest health the tree health will be open next year so that's um i can reassure the committee on that um so that one will be open excellent um as far as the agroforestry um one as you as you can imagine i, I mean i i We've worked extremely hard to get a smooth transition from the old SRDP to the new one. I came in on the tail end of the last transition and I saw the damage that had done both to my own staff and to people around. So I'm aware of the pain the last time. We've worked really hard and, and the sector have worked really closely with us to try and make this one as smooth as possible. However, I'm sure the committee is aware this is a very, very challenging thing to do. We have to make decisions about which ones we open first. Agroforestry will be open, but the decision was taken that that's something that will, that will open a bit later, but we wanted to be able to open quickly with the, the new woodland creation and with the, with, with the tree health um, and the, the forest infrastructure. Those ones will be open at the start of the new programme. That is our intention. The other ones we've had, we've had to delay um, and we had to take a decision of which were the ones to prioritise, but they will be opening. It's just appearing in this budget, obviously we're only looking at one year, so I hope, hopefully that gives you some reassurance. Yeah. I'm certainly reassured that the tree health yes. uh, support yeah. will yeah. be available, because yeah. I think that's obviously very topical at the moment. Obviously. Thank, thank, you. Me, thank you. Okay. I um, want to ask the Forestry Commission and the other witnesses uh, to comment on the profit and loss situation of uh, truly commercial forests within the National Forest Estate in comparison to private sector woodlands. How can we compare these? Can we compare them? What are the ballpark figures in terms of profit and loss? Is that, is that to me, or would you like? I to? think you would start. Yes, okay. uh, the Forestry Commission was the um, This this issue of what is a truly commercial forest, particularly when you're talking about public sector forestry, is a very tricky one because our whole reason for existence and the reason why we have a state forest service is for delivery of public benefit and as a result we manage the estate to deliver net public benefit now the forest enterprise which is the agency that runs the national forest estate have done a, a pretty detailed analysis of the estate to say okay are there any um, areas of woodland on here where on balance the net public benefit of the state being involved, you know, there isn't something important about them in terms of the net public benefit. And anywhere we could say, actually, you know, whether this was in the private sector or in the public sector, it would still be delivering the same public benefit. Um, they're the ones that we've been looking at in terms of repositioning, and I think this, uh, this committee's looked at the repositioning of the National Forest Estate previously. Um, so in terms of saying what is a truly commercial forest in a, in, a, in a state forest service where the objectives are to deliver multiple benefits and multiple public benefits is very, very difficult. Now, I did, I thought this might come up. <laughs> now, you have the budget, which is a few pages. Um, in terms of the details of the Forestry Commission accounts, which I'm sure Jamie is very familiar with, um, we publish our accounts each year, which go into huge amount of detail around the operating costs um, that we spend on the estate. But trying to say that this block of woodland here is commercial and this one isn't. I couldn't go to any area of the public forest estate and say this is truly commercial. I also think it's a bit risky as well because, as we've already heard, when a land manager is deciding what to do with a piece of land with the trees on it, often they're wanting to get many things from that, from that woodland um, and their objectives will be multiple as well. So this doesn't only apply to the state, to the state sector. So I think the premise that you that you could identify and account for commercial forestry separately is problematic. However, we do try to do it. So the way that um, we manage the, um, the, the accounting system with FE, when I'm in discussions with them, my director's in discussions with um, their chief executive about the balance, what we say is that their sustainable forest management activities, which is the harvesting and the restocking, is managed in one way, and then we and then we have a separate accounts for the other added value stuff like the um, the woodlands in and around towns program, branching out mental health stuff, the recreation things, and that is shown in the accounts clearly. Um, you can get the information on what we call the sustainable forest management accounts. So, um, 
I think there is a lot of the, the, the activities are pretty transparent financially, although that wouldn't come through in the budget because that necessarily has to be constrained to quite a small um, document. Yeah, we'll just come into that. And uh, did Jamie Farker want to kick in on this one? <coughs> However, um, I am familiar with um, the lightweight document that um, Joe's just waved at us. Um, Takes a lot uh, of trees. It, it is not actually a, a particularly simple document to in interpret. Um, but I, I, I do accept what, what she says, but it's... It, That's the next question. You can't, with the possible exception of going into the heart of, of somewhere like Estale Muir, um, you, it is very difficult to just pick out a... a a woodland or an, an ownership of woodlands and say that's productive or that's not. Um, you can immediately look at um, a stand of trees and you can rub your hands with glee and think, oh, this is 10 grand coming my way every hectare here. And then you can look at another stand and think, oh, I'm going to have to put how, how many thousands of pounds into that to just to... Uh, to rejuvenate it and, 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 and perhaps get nothing back. It's, it's not an easy equation. But public benefit in the round in managing commercial woodlands um, is being delivered by the private sector as much as it is by the National Forest Estate. The difference is the weighting that you would give in the National Forest Estate to some of the other agenda items which a private owner might not be prepared to invest in, like mountain biking facilities or um, a particular access and this sort of thing. Okay, uh, this could become more complicated than I thought, but anyway, um, Willie McGee. And yeah, uh, this is a very quick um, um, statement of the the difference between the public sector and the private sector. I'm not quite sure what has prompted the question, um, but certainly the Forest Policy Group and the the uh, the constituents of people like our members um, who are neither in the Confor camp, maybe have one foot there, um, or have dialogue with the public sector, we would see them as, as very different and, as Joe outlined, delivering very different things. I think one of the, the things uh, in terms of the complexity is that what happens with the Forestry Commission is that if you um, are building a new sawmill and or a biomass plant, then the Commission um, may be something that you want on your books for a certain percentage of your supply because you have the surety of continuity of supply. So the straight profitability per hectare may not be there, but the Commission fulfills um, different roles in terms of supporting um, rural development and or um, industrial development in a way that sometimes, I don't say always, but sometimes the private sector may not be able to do just because of pricing and or continuity of supply. Well, we have the situation that the inheritance of the estate of the Forestry Commission are in areas that probably should never have been planted if anyone was thinking about how they were going to be harvested. <laughs> you know, when I think about areas in my own constituency and those of Dave Thompson's in particular. So, you know, yeah, given that... That's that private and public, though. That's well, both, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Jim Colchester. Um, I'd just like to uh, add to Joe's point. I mean, with the clue, we're almost a microcosm of the same problems that the forest, National Forest Estate has in the fact that we have some that you could call commercial woodland, and but we also provide an awful lot of other woodland. But we do provide mountain bikes, um, paths around and around villages, etc. Now we have to cross subsidise that from the commercial pot. So I fully emphasise with the problem that Joe has with NFE and trying to do that on a national scale. Very tricky, because even within the li with the lifetime of a crop, its priorities can change. So at step. The real question, I think, is, is Forestry Commission, Forest Enterprise operating efficiently on those commercial woodlands? And from the outside looking in, I'd say it's not doing a bad job. That's a plaudit indeed. Uh, Nigel Don. Thank you, I was wondering if I could pick up on, on your suggestion that some forest is in the wrong place. And, and could, could the panel enlighten me? Has anybody ever actually looked at the map of Scotland, noticed where the forests are, noticed where they aren't, and said, well, they really ought to be here? I have. On all 
the grass. Are we, are, we built, are we planting in the right place? Any, anybody looked at the grand plan? It's called a map of Scotland. on forestry is that forestry goes where forestry can and agriculture no disrespect to agriculture has dominated in terms of the in, in terms of finance and land values so forestry was always forced into the uplands into the more marginal land onto the land that um, Ron was just talking about Rob was just talking about there in terms of the the um, flow country and or areas that were highly unsuitable so you could look at it and you could say, yes, it's on some unsuitable land. Where would you like it to be? Well, perhaps it might be on, on good quality arable land close to centres of population. But the fact is it's not going to go there anytime soon. Or it could be on grouse moors, but that's another thing. <laughs> Especially in your constituency, <laughs> Nigel. Don. Anyway, um, I want to ask yeah, the forest, Forestry Commission about this question. There are increasing numbers of renewable projects that you are facilitating. We haven't found out what the profit and loss account is for them, given that it's got responsibility to communities that get community benefit out of them. And I see long lists of projects which have been uh, undertaken. Uh, can you tell me where that appears in your accounts? Um, I can't. I can. We can write back to the committee if you would. If you'd like. Well, it's me to quite do an that. important part of income stream. It do you is. have any idea about a ballpark figure? Yes, yeah, so we're talking about an income of around 11 million next year. Um, or is that this? Year? Sorry, I think that's 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 for this year. Um, set against a timber timber income of around 70 million. So it's a growing a growing aspect of the income, and basically it's to try and broaden the. Um, to make the National Forest Estate more I resilient, I suppose, in service. terms of the timber cycle, timber prices we know go up and down like this, public sector money goes up and down like this, and when we're solely reliant on the timber income stream, that's not a particularly comfortable place for um, forest enterprise to be, because when the timber income drops, they've got nowhere else to go other than back to government for the money. So, so the, the, the strategy has been to grow the income coming from the renewables. Um, but I, I'm happy if you would like us to write back to you um, on that and point out to the section in the accounts, if that would be helpful. It would be very helpful indeed, yeah. yes. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish will take us on in this uh, area, I hope. Thank you. Um, I was going to say good morning, good afternoon <laughs> to everybody. Um, in the written submission from uh, uh, Scottish Policy, sorry, the Forest Policy Group, there's a highlight that the Forestry Commission's current disposals programme uh, might be um, used to encourage new entrants to forestry. And I know this has started, I understand. Um, and uh, in, in your submission, which... The, the highlight just for speed about um, communities and but also people of and I quote um, ordinary means uh, in in that so I wonder if um, firstly um, uh, Joe O'Hara you might comment on developments both in terms of sale and leasing and also if um, William McGee or other members of the panel would like to comment on how this can be taken forward okay um this is, this is slightly sort of moving on from, I, I think, um, from, from the budget, because there's some things which is about, it wasn't, there's not a budgetary constraint, there's been some legal constraints and supporting things like woodlots, um, mm -hmm. for, which we, that, we yeah. have been working very closely with the Woodlots Association and putting money um, into the Woodlots Association to try and develop that. We're also looking at whether there are opportunities with, for example, the Community Empowerment Bill to overcome some of the the legal barriers that there might be for creating woodlots on the National Forest Estate. So that's work in progress, but it probably wouldn't, you know, it doesn't appear as part of the budget. There's also the work on Crofter Forestry and Woodland Crofts as well, that we're, we're working with, with stakeholders to um, develop that. I think the other thing that, um, again, over the last year, we've really been looking at is um, ways of lotting up the forest sales. So as I mentioned earlier, the review of the estate, those ones where the net public benefit doesn't warrant the land remaining in public ownership. When we bring those onto the market, um, it was pointed out to us that although it might get the best return for the taxpayer by selling it to a single owner, um, there were maybe some other agendas about diversifying land ownership where we could also address this. So we're looking at when you, um, when we're marketing properties now, we are looking 
and, and consulting with local communities and looking for opportunities to sell them in smaller lumps so that they are made more available for a wider section of, of the community. It's not strictly a budgeting issue, but that's how we've been trying to address that issue. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, just to come in on, on the back of Joe, we, we, uh, we're, we're very keen to, well, and I've put it in the written evidence, three points. One, um, there's a lot made of starter farms, and I think that's great. And um, Jim Hume's just walked out the door, but we started that thinking in the borders. He might come back. He might come back, yes. <laughs> um, and um, we would like to see starter forests. So if the, 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 the uh, commission is buying land and it's having a starter farm, there's no reason why it cannot have a starter forest. That concept should be fairly and squarely on the table. Uh, secondly, you're, you're correct. The, we've been working with um, Forest Enterprise. Um, it's been a very productive relationship. They've been looking at sales um, of forests um, in, in, you know, from the northwest down to the central belt um, and how to put those into smaller blocks rather than selling them off as one large area, subdividing and selling them off. Now, we, uh, we see great public benefit in that and we'd like to, you know, to say that the Forest Commission has performed admirably um, in, a, in, a, in our estimation. The wood lots, wood lot is different to lotting a sale. That is the, where we are pushing for leasing of, of areas of forest land. Now, we have uh, had discussions with Paul Wheelhouse. We've discussed this with Forestry Commission. We've made submission to the Community Empowerment Bill. Um, we would really like to see Forestry Commission grabbing this one and saying we will have half a dozen pilots across Scotland um, and we can do this within some jiggery pokery um, uh, um, that doesn't mean that we run up against what is the, the Forestry Act. And that's something else that we put in this submission. The Forestry Act um, is the better part of 50 years old. It's no longer fit for purpose. And I think Scotland should have its very own Forestry Act. Um, Sounds like a very good item for our <laughs> legacy paper for uh, 2016. <laughs> yeah, so... But, uh, but marks out of 10 for the Forestry Commission, very high. Well, um, here we go. Uh, we have to deal with both disposals and acquisitions in this next sort of period. So disposals, first of all. Um, inevitably, you don't do the disposals. You use land agents in many cases, whose interest, obviously, for you is gaining the best kind of prices to add to uh, your, your total uh, cash budget. Um, but is it the best way to deal with these things? Because land agents very often are in a position usually to be attempting to do a different kind of job because communities and uh, certainly uh, the, the issue about uh, small pieces of land which are no longer required really should be targeted specifically at local groups rather than at commercial sales. And indeed, we had the issue about the sale of Rossell. The way in which that was handled was less than happy in my constituency. And I'm wondering if you could reassure me that uh, you've got a grip of whichever land agent you're using to give them an idea of how you see the general public interest being served as well as the cash interest in any disposals. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm not sure if the committee re remembers, but the last time I was here was almost exactly a year ago when I'd just, just started the job and Rosal was just kicking off when, um, that, that all, when that happened. And I think we have learnt a lot from the, the Rosal experience. FE definitely have. Um, <coughs> from what I have seen in the way that they... I'll, I'll just backtrack a bit. Um, in terms of... Forest Enterprises' role as custodians of the National Forest Estate. They manage the estate in the interest of the people of Scotland. And I'd just like to be clear um, that the money that's generated from these sales is really, there, there is a very strict process for any money that's generated from the sale gets reinvested in the estate in order to deliver more public benefit. It doesn't go into our cash flow um, and it's not used to fund revenue. So I just wanted to remind folk that that's that's where this money goes. Um, some of it is going into fund starter farms. Some of it is going into some of the more urban areas. And some of it is going to help with some of the more community 
activities. So it's just to be clear that that's where the, if we generate more money, the money is then going back to deliver more public benefit. I think that's an important principle. However, um, what we did learn from Mossel is I think um, the sensitivity of the handling of these sorts of land transactions and being being more, whilst generating the best value for the taxpayer, also being much more sensitive to, um, to local concerns. We have had sales that have gone through subsequently. We took Russell off the market and it's gone back onto the market. Um, and I, I would hope, Rob, I'd be interested to hear your, your take on it in terms of what you've seen happen since then, um, in terms of the way that sales have been handled in, in this way, because I have seen a change in the way that Forest Enterprise are handling it the instructions that they are giving to the agents to act on their behalf are much clearer on this and they're being much more careful about the way things are marketed and lotting is definitely um, appearing. Um, is there anything specific? That well, I, I'm, I realise that this could become quite detailed on a specific thing which could probably be dealt with uh, in terms of process at another point because okay. the budget is what we're here to, yeah. to focus upon. But... Um, uh, the point is that some of the people in Scotland are part of the, na the, the nation in local areas who look for very clear communication and indeed hope to gain uh, access. For example, to show that the National Forest Land Scheme is actually working mm -hmm. on behalf of local communities. Because, you know, if we did an assessment of how well it has performed so far, we might well find that we're not as happy with that as we could be and that indeed those elements related to uh, the needs of communities where land becomes available with trees on them, or indeed forestry commission-owned land that has not got trees on them, uh, is, is disposed of, is quite important to a lot of people. And I think we could probably, that's my comments in general about this, but I think the public estate is going to have to be a lot more sensitive about the way in which it deals with these things. And this is not a criticism, it's just an observation with a barb. Um, no, I'd rather we, 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 we better move on from that. But my point is that land agents are there to make a profit. So the instructions which you say are more specific are very welcome indeed. So thank you for that. Right. Uh, Alec Ferguson, I think you've got something to deal with now here with regard to acquisitions. Um, OK. Um, I, I, I start off with a very simple question. Can I ask what the uh, what the graph is of the Forestry Commission's acquisitions budget? The acquisitions budget. Well, how, how much is set aside for acquisitions? At the, the moment, it's at zero um, because we haven't been able to generate enough revenue from sales. So at the moment, the, the, that that pot is sitting. It's at about break even. Um, we. As I say, we have this mechanism for ring fencing any money that we generate from disposals in order to fund acquisitions. Where we are at the moment is that we have acquired land because of some of the sensitivities around um, NFLS and other issues with, with the community sales and, and other issues. We haven't been generating as much revenue from disposals as we might otherwise have done. So where we are at the moment is we have a, a portfolio of sites many of which haven't been planted yet. I was speaking to Forest Enterprise this morning, and I think the figures have got about 3,500 hectares of land that has not yet been planted um, that's associated with new acquisitions. Um, but we need to get the money in from the disposals in order to um, get that new planting done. And that's, those hectares contribute to the 10,000 target mm. as well. So, mm. so this, this thing, we don't... Um, the, the acquisitions and the disposals are inextricably linked. So, so really, your acquisitions budget is dependent on disposals. Yes. Is that? Yeah. Uh, and is that likely to continue to be the case? Yes, we've re we've reviewed it. We have met the um, the target that was originally set, and we're reviewing it at the moment. But we are but we are finding for exactly all the points that Rob's raising, um, disposals are becoming. And also because having reviewed the estate, we've done we've we've identified the sites where there is a low public benefit. Those have been sold. The ones that are left, we are getting to the point where, actually, the estate is now most of the woodlands in Scotland that are delivering greater net value, so net public value. So disposing of them gets more and more problematic. But equally, what that then means is when we want to do new things on new land with a public forest estate, we don't have the, 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 the money generated in order to do that. So 
they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to well, make just very quickly on the, on the disposals and acquisition. Um, again, we've been working with Forestry Commission over their, um, their, their disposals scoring scheme, if you like. How, how do you make a decision on what it is that you sell? And one of the things that we um, are hoping to, um, to pursue with Forestry Commission is a, is a positive attribute. In other words, where communities um, um, would benefit in terms of rural development or, or access to timber rather than what is at present um, a disposal of, if you like, the, the uneconomic, the rump, the, the marginal, the fragmented. Um, and and that's, a, that's a dialogue that we're continuing to have with Forestry Commission. Well, we have to deal do, do with the disposals question uh, more at the sharp end. I mean, it's argued that Forestry Commission um, uh, is able to outbid local bidders for particular pieces of land. And clearly, where uh, an agent is selling on behalf of a private owner, they're happy to get the highest amount that's possible from that land. But there isn't a mechanism to see that local interests actually are taken into account in this market transaction and where you're trying to maintain your budget and so on. So in terms of your acquisitions, um, what do you do to try and make sure that you're not cutting across the potential for local people to actually use that land who already are resident in the area? This is a very tricky one for me to answer, and I think I would have to refer to the Chief Executive of Forest Enterprise in terms of what they're doing in this regard at present. But as I said to Alex, as regards what's, what's coming up, we have very limited budget at the moment for doing acquisitions anyway. We do go through a lot of processes before we decide to bid on something. Um, as far as mechanisms that they have in place for checking that, I'm afraid I'd ha I'll have to come back to you in that or ask um, Forest Enterprise about it um, because it, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, how that relates to the budget. Well, I think it does in a way because you're saying there are 3,000 acres that have not been Hectors. planted Hectors. and uh, therefore that is a store of land. So the acquisition of more land at the moment, which you might be able to afford, uh, could affect uh, local interests. Mm -hmm. Nigel Muller mentioned the Lairg area. I think he was meaning a very, very large area of my constituency. But I can think of an example, a small example, in the area near to Lairg, where you know, a local family were extremely disadvantaged by the way in which a private sale went through and the Forestry Commission was able to bid more uh, than they were for a particular piece of land which would have allowed a family business to expand. So anything you can give us back from Forest Enterprise about that would be very useful. I have a lot of farmers in Caithness who are extremely upset about the string of sales that have taken place there and acquisitions of uh, what could have been sheep farms that Nigel Miller was discussing earlier on and therefore I think some, some evidence of this for the committee would help us in our budget as well as our more general understanding of land use, if you can provide them. Uh, Jim Colchester? Um, it's a bit of a shame that the leasing scheme that Forest Enterprise tried to do didn't gain more speed than it has. I think it's still a viable and a valued way of doing it because it does remove this competing for land problem because you're actually dealing with someone who's wanting to plant on that bit of ground, farmer, state owner, whoever it is, it does remove this pieing land. And I think a bit more work and a bit more um, tweaking of that, and I think you'll actually start to see more, a, a better option that way, to actually deliver the planting target that we actually want. We're well, after the trees in the ground. Yeah. Nigel Miller? Sorry, just... Really, to you know, echo your concerns, convener, you know, and you've given some really you know, key examples. I think of uh, you know, where these pressures have arisen, and I think anybody who's you know, driven around Caithness recently must wonder you know, uh, how some of these decisions have actually been rolled out. Uh, and you know, similar things have happened in the Scottish border. So it's it's not just uh, yeah. you know, the northern part of Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is that you know, the, the the you know the pressure on planting has actually you know, raised the value of uh, uh, you know, uh, permanent grass and, and rough grazing in, in marginal areas. That that's the reality. So that all farming interests are now competing against that uh, a very much higher baseline. Thank you. 
That's all handy to know, but uh, we'll look forward to some more details, if we can, from Joe about these matters. That's very good. Right, yourself. Uh, uh, thank you for Graham Day. But apologies for not asking this a little bit earlier. It, it, picking up on Joe Harris' point about the disposals funding acquisitions on a ring-fence basis, that being the case, what does the substantial income from renewables go on? So are you getting into the details of, of FE? Do you mind if I just refer to my, uh, <laughs> my business plan? Um, in terms of... We are trying to encourage forest enterprise to move the National Forest Estate into a position where it can provide a growing level of public benefit to the people of Scotland at a reducing cost. Okay, so that, that, that's what we're trying to do with the estate. And um, we've already talked about the number of different benefits that can accrue from the estate, be it to urban people, rural people, um, and everyone in between. The means by which we can do that are, are varied in terms of the way that we can generate revenue and where we can spend it. The revenue that comes from the renewables, certain aspects of that will go into improving the return that we get from renewables <coughs> investment but most of it will go into the delivery of other public benefits from the estate it goes into their net bottom line so if you see at the moment we are subsidized we're, we're, we're paying forestry commission scotland 21 <coughs> forest enterprise scotland sorry 21 around 21 million per year that's the net subsidy that goes from, from government. All of their other activities they fund through income generation, including the, um, the renewables. Okay? So the money that's coming from the renewables is, goes into the pot for expenditure on the, um, sort of the recreation facilities, the biodiversity work, the starter farms, the investment in forest infrastructure, some of the liabilities we have, for example, in terms of wrong trees in the wrong place and liabilities to do with steep slopes. So... So that element, I, I'm pretty certain that that element, they don't ring fence that, that's just for renewables. That goes into the pot and it reduces the amount of public subsidy that we are having to, to go from the Forestry Commission budget to run the National Forest Estate. Is that...? OK, all right, thank you for that. Do I just move on? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, if, if we move on to a slightly different subject, con for in the written evidence question just what exactly is funded under the programme costs header. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think they've suggested five uh, possible headings, contribution to forest research funding, timber development, timber transport, including the Scottish Strategic Timber Transport Scheme, tree health and development of the wood fuel sector. I wonder if Joe O'Hara can confirm that they're right in that assumption and perhaps outline for us uh, what else comes out of this £21 million budget okay. header. The, the biggest item that's missed on that is that includes the funding for all our conservancy staff. So all of our regional offices, which is the bulk of our, um, our staff in the regions who do advisory work, administer the grants, and, and all of that side of things, is also, it's not particularly clear, Jamie, I, I can understand that. That's, that's the biggest chunk of it that, that doesn't come out of that. Well, thank you. In light of that, can I ask Jamie Farker, does that uh, satisfy Confor's uh, concerns in any way? Um, Yes, I, 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 um, that's a relief because there was a big hole otherwise. <laughs> my understanding of the sort of sums of money that might have gone on the headings I, I had identified. The one thing I was actually uncertain about, is it right that you, it does include some money to forest, to forest research within the, or is that some, tied up with the plant the, health stuff? So. Yes, it does, yeah. So to be clear, that the, the five headings that they have, the CONFOR have suggested are accurate? Yes, yes, yes largely. I think it was just the programme costs. There's yeah. a whole lot of stuff in there, um, but it does include the, the running of the Conservancy offices, yeah. which I think doesn't come through particularly clearly. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Are we comfortable? Could, could I just re reinforce how vital the, 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 three, the five things, at least, that I have uh, identified? I mean, those are... Um, I immensely valuable to continuing confidence in the sector and therefore the sort of investment that you're seeing at the processing end of, uh, of our industry. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, well, just, well, just very quickly, I mean, I guess from, from the Forest Policy Group, 
standpoint, um, we, we uh, appreciate the, uh, the funding that comes from Forestry Commission to support the Scottish Woodlots Association um, and other items of funding um, for, if you would like, community development, community empowerment. They've got a, a dedicated um, member of staff in Forest Enterprise um, who does this. I would like to put a marker down and say I would like to see more funding allocated within the Commission um, to the very question of diversification of ownership, management of, of woodlands using um, local communities, um, just for the record. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thanks, Kavina. Um, RSPB in their uh, written submission states, and I quote, that they consider the prioritisation within the budget allocation for forestry in 2015-16 lacks sufficient focus on meeting the biodiversity needs of Scotland and the Scottish Government's commitment to them, and that's both within SRDP and the management of the National Forest Estate. Do any of the panel have any comments on that, please? Uh, Jamie Parker. Um, I, 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 I will uh, be correct if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, agri-environment um, measures have received a very considerable mm -hmm. boost in terms of the SRDP budget. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, RSPB are, 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 are have a very, very significant influence on the, on the way in which the support measures under SRDP are, are, yeah. are given. Um, I am surprised by that comment, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I would certainly disagree with my limited experience on uh, some of the specific projects such as black grouse and that sort of thing. The work is being led through, um, through FC and presumably you're bearing the costs as a result. Nigel Miller. Yeah, uh, my views are pretty similar, but I think they did draw uh, a sort of attention to the actual threat of the various plant diseases and how that might impact on habitats. Uh, and I think that was a valid issue, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's probably, you know, having read both CONFORS and the RSPB's uh, 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 submission, you know, to me that's a common strand, and probably from the agricultural point of view, you know, uh, uh, maintaining the, the plant health seems to be pretty crucial at this time, and, uh, you know, flatlining the, the research doesn't seem particularly sensible, uh, and if there is some slack in the budget over the next year or so because of lower planting, having the flexibility to actually try and uh, uh, you know, take this uh, challenge uh, head on uh, so we can actually try and push it back you know, would make perfect sense. And they have some real examples there, obviously, about uh, you know, you know, native pine forests or, or uh, I suppose, historic pine forests and, and blaeberries and things like this, you know, key parts of our habitat. But it's, it's far wider than that. It's, it's uh, 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 you know, ash and other trees as well. So you know, I think that was a point well made. But certainly the, uh, the overall thrust, I would, I would be in the same place as, as others. Thank you for that. Um, Cara Hilton. Yeah, perhaps have a question at the end. Um, yes, I mean, Alex Ferguson already touched on this before to do with tree health, and <laughs> Claudia um, <laughs> Nigel's given a bit of an answer too. Um, He's yeah. In the written submission, RSPB Scotland ah, okay. highlighted the work of the Forestry Commission carried out in relation to threats posed by po uh, forest uh, diseases, and CONFER also talked about the wave of tree health issues. So I would like to ask the panel, do you think the size of the budget for tree health is sufficient going forward, or do you think it needs to be increased? No, it's not sufficient. Yes, it should be increased. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Yes. Uh, there's nothing like saying it should be increased, so we've got to find out where that comes from, I guess. But you know, that's Cheaper the words in my mouth. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie. I, we, we, we said in, in, uh, uh, and have been saying for two years now that uh, we believe forest, the forestry budget on its own is not necessarily the right place to expect all, this, all the money to, to fund plant health issues. Um, that there are, you know, for those of you who, who've been into the heart of Galloway or, or, or up in, into um, parts of the flow country, the devastation from the two respective diseases is, is, is on an environmental scale of, of, of horrific proportion. And uh, if you look at the problem that we are facing in, in the, the flow country of trying to move two million tonnes of timber at the moment on a road that we are restricted to just ten wagons a day, we are not, unless we can move 
the whole discussion sideways into another, another box where we can draw down some other money, we are not going to solve that problem and you are going to have an environmental nightmare up there with more trees on the ground, more trees diseased. But this is probably not the, the, the time for this particular conversation, but it is a, it's a problem that is re really quite desperate. I understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. that, that this is talking about perhaps parts of the uh, other budgets that need to be helped in order to create this possibility. But we do notice in my constituency areas of roads, which are not trunk roads, that have been designated as uh, trial uh, areas of road to see how they're wearing under the uh, increased forestry traffic at the moment and how we actually fund that to answer, which which helps, you know, would, would be very interesting for us to discuss, but we're going to have to discuss it with other people. So thanks for raising that. Did anyone else have something to say? Yes, Joe O'Hara for... Uh, for I'll just come back on it. Um, it's always difficult when you see a, f a fairly high-level budget um, proposal for one year. Um, the amount of work that's going on on tree health underneath this is more than just about the money. Um, it's absolute top priority for our research budget. I think we're also um, grappling with the de definition of a new type of forestry. This is, a, this is not an issue just for, for Forestry Commission. It's an issue for the practice of forestry and where are we going with it? What should we be planting when we clear the larch, for example, in the, that's been diseased in Galloway? What should we be planting? And some of the expenditure is hidden. So you asked about the program budget, the, 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 the 21 million in there. A large chunk, chunk of that would be for, for research, some of it for the timber transport fund, which is helping to fund um, some of these issues to do with, with transport. So it doesn't appear in the headline. And the other place that obviously is spending a lot of money is um, Forest Enterprise on the National Forest Estate, because most a, a huge chunk of the larch that was hit in Galloway was actually on the National Forest Estate land. So some of this money that's being generated from renewables and, and timber is going in to, to, to address some of those issues down there. So it's all, it doesn't always just come down to what the budget figure is. Nigel Miller? Sorry, you know, obviously I've made a comment before, so I really just reiterate that that's my position. But I think that you know, Joe's comments about you know, the actual impact and, and Jamie's you know, is pretty significant. And the reality is you know, this is about priorities. And, and you know, if we're looking at you know, different approach to planting, you know, now's the time to actually come up with that different approach before we plant again and, and create the problem. So, you know, if it ma means dragging money into this budget to actually accelerate that work and, and stalling other work, that to me is pri how you prioritise, because you know, uh, you know, going on without taking or, or cognizance of where we've got to, you know, is a mistake. Jim, you? Yeah, thanks very much. Only, uh, money did grow on trees. I think all our answers, our oh. answers would be uh, answered. <laughs> um, yeah, just going back to practice and budget and different approaches, and obviously uh, plant health. And some of, some of you have talked to this a bit uh, uh, before off the record. Um, but we have seen a, a tendency to use very large um, nurseries, uh, sometimes in. Uh, lands not in Scotland. Is, is there, within the budget, has there been any develop, which of course can lead to plant uh, diseases jumping very rapid areas because you're not buying from a local source, you're buying from uh, out, out with Scotland. Um, so uh, is there any budget development regarding uh, developing local nurseries where you can uh, buy your trees from a local nursery, therefore reduce the risk of uh, bringing in disease from much further away? Work, the nursery sector is a, is, is a small but hugely significant sector in forestry and it often gets forgotten about because people think about forests. Um, and, and I would say it's a, it, is a, it is a small, like I say, it's a small but crucial part. Um, pretty exposed with all of this, uh, both in terms of fluctuating planting um, figures um, and in terms of what's happening with disease, we have worked very closely with when we had the nursery resilience plan and extra funding that went in over the last the last couple of years to help nurseries move. Um, I think the realities of large scale planting, and I'm talking about you know 100 hectares plus type planting, is you know, small local nurseries can't service that demand because they need to be able to operate at scale in order to be. Um, viable businesses. Well, the large local nurseries then. Well, large local nurseries. <laughs> um, 
So um, it, it is a sector that we are working closely with. There are key parts in the chain. They're particularly affected by the plant health thing. We have new and stricter plant health um, controls in place and the way that we're, that we're enforcing those. So um, I think you're, you're right to, to alight on the nursery yeah. sector as a key player in all of this. Thanks. Okay, uh, Jamie Farker, yes, finally. Could I just say the, the CONFOR um, has a, a, a special nursery producers group um, which meets on a regular basis and um, uh, we have a, we're now having an annual um, um, meeting with Forestry Commission and Forest Research um, which is proving very, very helpful at this moment when we are facing the, just the sort of problems you're, you're talking of, Jim. So, um, and I, if it would be helpful, I'm, I'm sure I can get the, the group to um, give, give yourselves a, a, a briefing of what they've been up to. That would be very helpful indeed. Thank you. Well, uh, we've had quite a detailed session here. Uh, it's an important one because I don't think we've actually looked at forestry in recent times specifically with regard to the budget. And every sector that we look at wants to get value for money and to deliver value for money. But uh, that's a very uh, detailed and varied uh, issue, which, you know, the budget throws up. And I'm glad that we've been able to do this. And I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for giving us their opinions, because when we question the minister, we'll be able to reflect that varied set of interests that there are. So I'd like to thank the witnesses, but particularly I'd like to thank Nigel Miller, uh, because this may well be his last parliamentary appearance um, before he demits office. Uh, Nigel has uh, applied his uh, sharply focused leadership to the NFU uh, on behalf of farming and crofting, and we thank him very much for that. And uh, it looks as though he might even get a job in CONFOR, but... Uh, on the <laughs> That would be ironic, but, but, but nevertheless, thank you all, and thank you, Nigel, in particular, for that. And I, I will close much. this meeting just now by saying that our next meeting on Wednesday, the 12th of November, the committee will take evidence from stakeholders on the draft budget and will consider the Goose Petition PE1490 uh, following responses from the Scottish Government. I close the meeting now. <laughs>